is uh, very much useful. CIH, uh, that is Certified Industrial Hygienist, uh, is a certification from Board of a Global EHS Credential in USA. Uh, previously, they were ABIH, that is American Board of Industrial Hygiene. Um, so what are the ways to become certified in both the areas uh, is what we are going to talk about. So uh, today's instructor, uh, we will first start with Lalita. Uh, Lalita is a PhD and CIH. Uh, she is a director at Nayati International India. Uh, she has, I think, more than uh, 35 years of experience. Uh, she uh, had uh, uh, industrial hygiene uh, laboratory in USA uh, for the IH sample analysis. So she has a very good experience about uh, IH uh, sample analysis. Additionally, uh, since uh, she moved to India, she has uh, offered, started offering uh, this OHTA modules uh, uh, to the professionals who are working. <coughs> and uh, she has started, uh, I believe, since 2008. And with help of uh, industrial professionals, she has conducted uh, I think many of the OHTA modules uh, physically also, which means when uh, the classroom session and all before COVID and after COVID uh, since uh, OHTA and BOHS has allowed an online format, <clears throat> we are uh, conducting this online. So I support Lalita in conducting this uh, <coughs> OHTA and the BOHS uh, training module. Uh, so Lalita will speak uh, about ICERT OH for around uh, 50 minutes of the time, so probably about 2.55 to 3 o'clock. Then we have invited Pinky Butt, who is also a CIH. Uh, she is LFOH, UHS, and uh, she has uh, a very inspiring journey and how she uh, turned her career from a safety officer to a global occupational hygiene. Mm -hmm. Uh, is what she will touch. There is an important aspect of a PLP. That's a personal learning portfolio. Once you complete all the module, you will need to submit your personal learning portfolio and then face an interview. So she will share her experience about uh, how she prepared for it and what are some of the useful insight. So uh, actually she was traveling from uh, Europe to India. Uh, she had a jet lag, uh, so she will be joining us uh, anytime between 2.30 to 2.45. So she will talk around 10 to 15 minutes uh, of the time. So do you have a question? If not, I will request that you keep your mic on the mute, please. So she works with John. Lalita, you can help me out uh, for temporarily uh, to mute the line. And then mm -hmm. I will uh, do it during your turn. So she works at Johnson Mete as a, a senior occupational hygienist in Europe. She has 15 plus years of experience. And she was also the ICERT OH student of the year uh, 2018. So she has received that award from BOHS. About me, uh, I am CIH and CSP. Currently, I run my own industrial hygiene ventilation and ergonomic consulting with 18 years of experience. Before uh, starting consulting company, I worked with the uh, 3M as a Asia leader and uh, uh, GE as the global IH leader also. So <clears throat> this is about the instructor that uh, we are going to have today. Some of the rules, uh, we want you to ask question. Uh, since this program is for you, we are not here to teach you the technical aspect, but we are here to tell you about how to progress in your professional life and how to achieve the next milestone in your career. So please ask question. Uh, you can ask questions by posting on the chat window. Sometimes uh, a participant says that chat window is not available from there for them. So you note down my WhatsApp number uh, that is 97425275257. In case chat window doesn't work, you can send it on the WhatsApp also, as well as you can unmute the line, uh, audio line, and then you can ask questions. Uh, we will be more than happy uh, to answer the questions. So, uh, if we do not have any answer, we will get back to you 
after consulting BOHS, OST or the BGC uh, also. <clears throat> so we encourage that you ask question, but once your question is over, I will request that you keep your line on the mute also. Uh, some uh, aspects of the logistics, uh, if you're attending this call from your office or your home, <clears throat> please ensure that you know where is an emergency exit and in case of any emergency alarm, uh, please leave the building. You do not need to inform us that you are leaving this uh, classes. This session is uh, for approximately two hours. Actually, we scheduled for three hours, but <clears throat> that includes question and answer. So we will see that how it goes, uh, but any any duration between two to three hours is what we feel that uh, will be the timeline. The material that we have prepared here is from the OHTA, BOHS and BGC's uh, manual. And it is interpreted as per our knowledge uh, based on what we saw in those manuals. In case if you need more clarification, of course you can write it to us. We will approach BOHS, OST and BGC and give you the right answer. But if you want to approach them also directly, uh, we will tell you their website address during this uh, two hours of the session. <clears throat> now, I am attending this call uh, from a remote location. So in case if there is an internet failure uh, at my place, uh, you are requested to stay online for two minutes. I have alternate internet arrangement with me also, so I will reconnect. So I will hand it over to Lalita, but before that I will still say when you are referring the slide which Lalita is presenting or when speaking about or when I am talking. If you have any question, please ask question. Uh, uh, whatever the question that comes in the chat window, I will ask it to Lalita chat window or my WhatsApp or the audio line. I will ask her at the end of her uh, uh, slide, each slide, <clears throat> and then we will try to answer the question. But do not keep any doubt in your mind uh, in case if still there is any doubt that is in your mind you can later on write an email, contact us, uh, and then we will be able to uh, answer your questions through email also. One more disclosure that uh, we are recording this session uh, for the interest of uh, everyone uh, in case uh, uh, we want to refer it in the future uh, uh, or uh, the BOHS or the BGC would like to use some of the presentation material. Uh, we are recording this session, uh, so this is a disclosure that we would like to make it. So with this, excuse me, with this uh, over to Lalita, uh, I will request you Lalita to please uh, share your screen and uh, unmute your line. Yeah, so thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Strini. Can just give me a second to share my screen. Okay, all okay. Can you all hear me and uh, see my screen? I can see. Yes, we can. Yeah, okay. Yes. Yes, sure. Oh, so first of all, thank you all so much for uh, coming this afternoon. Um, initially, we kind of thought the way the idea that we had was because we had so many uh, students who were almost or uh, ready to complete all the six BOHS modules uh, that are being offered. And um, we wanted to show them that there is additional steps beyond the six modules where, you know, those are steps are going to be useful uh, in your career. So we thought maybe those are the people who would be most interested. But then once we uh, opened it up and started registering, um, you know, there was also a lot of registrations from people who who haven't done any BOHS courses or, you know, they probably don't even know about it. So and then we thought, you know, maybe this is a good opportunity to uh, introduce IH and what are the not just the certifications, but pre-certifications also. Just get to know and understand what IH is, what are the different training programs that are out there um, that people can take advantage of. Um, so 
um you know we kind of opened it up to um everybody i and i think we do have in the audience uh, some of them who have not uh, had the experience of taking any bohs courses or about uh, know about ohta so um you know we'll probably spend a little bit time introducing that part also uh, so to give a you know complete picture uh, of the whole OH training program to to everybody. And like Srinik said, we are recording this. So, you know, if you know somebody who is interested, you can just um, um, refer this to them also. So they can, you know, they can uh, ask us for it or we can share it with them. Um, so just about us, or about uh, Nayati and uh, Rico, uh, many of you know that we have been conducting these uh, BOHS and OHTA training programs online uh, since COVID, uh, but uh, even before that, uh, we were uh, doing the in-person courses at that time. Um, initially, though, uh, uh, as Naiti, we have started um, the training program actually in 2008. That was the first one. Um, it was there wasn't any OHTA or BOHS scheme or these type of modules available at that time. So uh, in 2008, we just did the, uh, I believe it was just the first uh, ever uh, industrial hygiene workshop in India. Um, and um, I think some of you from this group also uh, attended that uh, uh, workshop and it, it went really well. We had faculty from NIOSH USA and uh, WHO, World Health Organization and, and um, you know, other uh, experts. Uh, so that was the first step, actually, that uh, we have introduced, uh, you know, our activities for promoting industrial hygiene um, in India. But since then, uh, you know, we have made a lot of progress. Um, and, you know, it's after like about what, 12 to 15 years or so. So um, that was actually the beginning. And, and we have come a long way from there. We still have quite a few, uh, a, a long road to travel. But uh, that's basically the introduction of uh, what we do. And uh, Shinik has been with us and we have been working together uh, from the very beginning. So um, IH, uh, actually where we are now, um, like I said, over the past 10 or 12 years, um, we did come a long way, um, mainly because of some of these courses, but because uh, also in general, the profession has gained a lot of uh, recognition both from the employers as well as uh, you know the individuals who are interested in it. Um, we do have a national IH association for those um, who are not aware. Uh, you can go to the website. It has a very um, active membership and uh, annual international conferences uh, have been conducted um, for the past nine years, I think so far. Uh, Srinik was in the advisory board, uh, so you know, um, he can probably address a little bit more about it um, if there is time. Um, and since uh, 2012, the number of CIHS, like uh, cent uh, Certified Industrial hygien uh, Hygienist is, a, you know, a lot of you know, it is a very coveted, uh, reputed uh, certification uh, that industrial hygienists, you know, really would want to have. And we now have like about 40 uh, CIHS in, in India. Uh, that's a that's a big progress and several of them are um, wonderfully gainfully employed in a lot of uh, multinational companies and uh, many of them are uh, abroad in the European their either their corporate offices or, or in other capacities. So from two in 2012 these numbers have increased to uh, about 40 now and uh, and that's not enough for the industry of our size I think uh, we need a lot more. Um, and now we have about, um, uh, like I said initially, the these courses in in the beginning in 2012 when the OHTA and the BOHS initiated this uh, scheme, they were all in-person courses, and we used to do it like for a week-long course, full day, uh, eight-hour uh, courses. But then the frequency we couldn't do that many because it was expensive for people to travel to the location where the courses were held. 
and they have to take the whole week off from work, uh, travel accommodation and travel and uh, accommodation expenses. Uh, so, so the frequency was quite um, limited. Uh, we were doing maybe one to three courses a year. Uh, but then once uh, COVID happened, um, it has really uh, opened up the opportunities and the interest also among a lot of um, professionals. And, you know, many of you know about that. And the number of people who are uh, participating in this training modules have also increased. And now they are about uh, 100 to 150 candidates participating in this OH training in the year. But this is based only on this past uh, two, three years since uh, this is a 2020 number, uh, mostly for the online format uh, format. Um, so, you know, it's it's been a really uh, good opportunity for the profession to be um, expanding. Um, and, you know, like I said, several corporations now have uh, IHS on their EHS uh, staff. They have incorporated industrial hygiene uh, as, as, a, as an important uh, integral uh, discipline in their comprehensive EHS programs. So the certifications are, are, are very, um, you know, are, are a really good uh, resource and uh, needed thing, I think, for um, your career to, to advance. So as professionals, you know, we all know that uh, continuing education and career advancement, it's never stops. It is, it is an ongoing process and we all really have to work for it very hard to keep up with the, uh, with the competition or with the needs for the industry. And um, continuing education would be, you know, the really best and single way that can um, actually show the road to make this uh, our uh, career advancement be a continuous process. So um, Shinik has already mentioned a little bit, but I kind of want to make it official that uh, the information that we are providing is a compilation of uh, all the information <clears throat> that is available in the website. But we also have a lot of, uh, you know, personal feedback and, uh, uh, you know, communications with BOHS, their qualifications team and their professional team. They have shared a lot of information with us. So we have put everything together and uh, uh, and trying to present this. But, you know, the rules change. Um, they will be updated. Uh, procedures change. So it's always is uh, you know good that candidates uh, you know you you keep updating yourself review the website on and off <clears throat> uh, get the questions and we are trying to give give you as much information and answer as many questions that you have but i'm sure there may be some we may not be able to answer but just write to us and we will definitely go to bohs ohta or abih uh, and get back to you on any additional information that we need so um also i want to go to a little bit background about how this OHTA and BOHS collaboration has uh, come about. Um, so, you know, you'll get a background on that, especially for those who haven't had the opportunity of, uh, uh, you know, knowing about this uh, certification scheme. So OHTA began as a, uh, it's an occupational hygiene training association, which began as a very um, informal collaboration of uh, different agencies and uh, professionals and experts throughout the globe. Uh, most of them are volunteers. They have given a lot of uh, time and effort uh, to make this um, happen. Um, initially, uh, the way this has actually come about was when a uh, lot of these multinational companies started uh, their facilities in in countries like india or china and several in the europe they needed uh, some kind of a mechanism where they have trained industrial hygienists to take care of their workforce in in these other uh, developing countries and other countries where their facilities are but it so happened that none of these countries had any ih experience at all they didn't have any local expertise to uh, you know, to, to, to take, take care of their workforce. So the only solution was actually to create something or to develop something and provide the resources uh, to these communities where they can, um, you know, train them 
globally, like make a uniform quality training. So all these uh, facilities will have a good standard industrial hygienists uh, on their locations to take care of their facilities. So that was the initial motivation for, uh, uh, you know, for this program to happen. Um, this actually started in 2011 and 2012, but it probably took several years of uh, uh, you know, work on the part of all the participants and the stakeholders by the time they have actually come up with the uh, with the whole uh, material and the resources and everything. So they have about uh, 25 or so occupational hygiene organizations, including um, BOHS, that is British Occupational Hygiene Society, which is an important uh, collaborative uh, partner with OHTA and American Industrial Hygiene Association. Uh, and Board of Global EHS Credentialing, like uh, earlier it was mentioned, this is the current name for the American Board of Industrial Hygiene, which awards the CIH certification, and IOHS International Organization for uh, uh, for Occupational Hygiene. So these are just some of them, but there are several other organizations. And basically it was formed to promote better standards of industrial hygiene or occupational hygiene training practices. And its other mandates also includes managing the training and uh, qualifications framework. They have actually created, uh, designed this framework, I would say, of different kinds of qualifications at uh, different levels uh, globally in a uniform way so that everybody has, uh, that is why all the certifications are internationally recognized because the standards are uniform all over the all over the globe. So you get a certification from India, it, it's not from India, it's, it's a global certification. It is valid uh, anywhere you go to any company in any location. Um, it also provides free access to educational material through its website. You can go to ohtatraining.org uh, um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, information available on there. All the modules that are available there uh, that they have their uh, content that you can download, the student manuals, the syllabus and everything. Um, the student manual is pretty extensive. Though that is what all the courses are based on. So you know anybody can freely download and use it, but within the copyright laws uh, of UK. So you know you cannot freely distribute, and there are some other restrictions like that. But for your own personal study and use, you can freely download and um, use them at your own pace. So you know there's no time limit on how you study, and it also approves uh, training providers. Uh, only approved training providers are allowed to offer these courses, uh, again, because the uh, standards are global and they want to maintain those global standards and retain the uh, the level of uh, quality of these courses. They approve training providers based on the qualification of the tutors and, uh, you know, the procedures that they follow are all uh, pretty strict and uh, uh, prescribed that the training providers have to follow. Um, and, you know, you can actually go to the website and find a list of training providers that are uh, available. There are training providers in different countries, so you can go and look it up and uh, choose whichever training provider that uh, uh, that you all would like to go. Uh, we are, of course, also approved training providers, both Naite and Rico are. That is the OHTA training website. Um, uh, and you know you can use the modules free of charge, but within the copyright laws. Tr review training materials, details of qualifications scheme, um, and you can actually look for a course if you're interested in a specific course. You can look into there and find out uh, who is offering that course, where it is offered, all the details and everything. So you know it's it's a very good resource. So. Now, actually, coming into the uh, into the real cream of what this whole uh, pathways and the procedure is about, um, OHTA has developed about eight training modules. Now, this is again, it is put forth by the collaboration of all of these experts globally. So each one has uh, each module has a different uh, you know, uh, student manual and syllabus and the content. Some of them are pretty in-depth and some of them based on the topic, like for example, 
the 201, W201, it is a very basic module. It's a foundational module. It covers all general aspects uh, of basic principles in um, occupational hygiene. And of course, you have the 500 series. Uh, you have seven different models um, that are modules, sorry, that are available. Um, for those who don't have any uh, IH experience, we strongly uh, recommend, suggest uh, to first do the 201 module so that you will have an understanding of this first and then go to the 500 series because the 500 series modules tend to be um, kind of deep, a little bit deep at least, not advanced, but they're intermediate level. And the courses themselves um, have, uh, some of them have calculations and uh, the exam itself is also, um, I would say, sometimes challenging. So if you don't have any basic occupational hygiene knowledge, then they may seem to be a little bit difficult and, you know, you don't want to get, uh, you know, demotivated finding it so hard. So we, we urge that if no, if someone doesn't have any IH background at all to do the 201. Uh, but if you want to, uh, you know, towards certification, the 201 doesn't apply. So you have to do the 501 series only. So the 201 will be, you will be doing for uh, getting a basic awareness on your own. It doesn't lead to a certification. You will, of course, get an individual certificate of completion of that particular module, but it doesn't lead you into the next step. Uh, the other 500 series modules, they are all intermediate level, mo uh, level modules, uh, which is what we are at this time concerned about. So you have seven modules available. Uh, 501 deals with measurement of uh, hazardous uh, substances. It will teach you on how to actually sample uh, risk assessment, uh, how you do that. Um, how you do the uh, sample monitoring and uh, different for different types of hazards and so forth. 502 is all about thermal environment. Um, 503 is about noise measurement and its effects. And this module by itself is an integral uh, part of the requirement for the subsequent uh, steps in the certification that we will uh, see you know, in the in the coming slides. Uh, 501 is for uh, asbestos and other fibers. Uh, 505 is control of uh, hazardous substances. 506 is ergonomics. And 507 is the health effects of um, hazardous uh, substances. So um, these are the you know general uh, structure of all the modules or the number of modules that are available. Again, like I said, you can go to the training.org website and the student manuals and the syllabus of for all of these modules are freely available. Those who are interested can download and review the content of it. So how does the course uh, format looks like? So uh, we can still do the in-person or online. In-person is also, uh, you know, if, if someone wants it uh, uh, on site, uh, we can do that. That is also available. Online, of course, uh, uh, it's an online format. Um, the number of hours would be each course is 40 to 45 hours. It comprises of uh, individual lectures. There are detailed case studies and we discuss those case studies in the class. Um, there are videos based on you know, e each uh, a scenario for that particular uh, topic. There are group discussions. Um, when we do online, we have break rooms where we discuss, you know, give a case study and have people discuss it and then report it. So it is a very interactive type of uh, uh, training program. Now, in addition to the uh, lectures, we also have practical sessions, and this is a very important part of the course. In-person courses, of course, <clears throat> practical sessions, we um, actually have the instruments out there. Uh, whatever is relevant to that particular module. If it is 501 for measurements, then you will have all the sampling pumps, sampling media, calibrations, and all related aspects. Um, and if it is a noise course, we have sound level meters and all the relevant uh, instruments that are needed for controls. So we have a demo uh, ventilation system, so we can show you how to measure the different uh, criteria like phase velocities and so forth. Uh, how to do that. Um, and uh, even on online, 
we do have a live online demonstration of uh, all these practical aspects and it is also required by OHT and BOHS that uh, this being successful in the practical um, sessions is a integral part again you have to be um, you have to pass the practical assessment for your written examination to be actually valid so that's an important aspect and at the end of the course there is a three hour exam uh, whatever format it is whether it is in person if it is an online it is an online exam uh, it's an open book we have 40 questions short answers they're not multiple choice uh, short answers are just like three or four sentences you don't have to write like big paragraphs or anything and 50 percent is the pass score required and these evaluate these exams are evaluated directly by the bohs and the successful candidate will directly get the um, certificate awarded uh, by OHTA and uh, BOHS together. Um, so that's the basic uh, basic information on the training modules. Um, any questions um, up till now? OK, OH so OHTA now and BOHS, they are the same thing, uh, same entities. OHTA. No, there are two different entities. OHTA is the training association that is that has created these training modules, all the seven, eight training modules. Uh, and BOHS is the entity that actually uh, does the administers the exam. They have the papers, exam papers. They administer the exam. They evaluate. They decide who passes and fails. So they are they award the certificate, but there is an arrangement between OHTA and BOHS to to work together in collaboration. Both are based in UK. BOH, OHTA also now has an office in US, but they're headquartered in UK. Okay, thanks, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. So the next level, uh, oh. again, there are three different or four different uh, training levels that OHTA has uh, actually put forth. One is the awareness level. It's like the basic thing, but it is not specifically to occupational hygiene. They have an awareness course online, um, general occupational health and safety related awareness course. Um, and then there is the foundation, which is the W201 we were talking about. Uh, for those who are working in non-IH areas like health or medical or uh, safety, if, if they are not comfortable directly going to the 500 series, you can do the foundation level course. Uh, but you would still get a certificate of successful completion for that particular uh, module. And then next one is the intermediate level, which is what we are concerned at this time and which is what leads to this uh, ICERT OH certification. And this is for those who study the technical knowledge and they want to actually uh, make IH also a part of their professional um, career. And they want to do occupational hygiene assessments and related work in the field. Uh, this is the qualification that leads to the ICERT OH level uh, certification. Uh, where all those modules that we described before are involved. And the next level is also available, which is called the specialist level, but it's not yet completely developed. Um, there are just a couple of modules on the specialist level. They have one for mining, I believe. Uh, and then there is a pharma module also, uh, but the pharma module is still under the works. It's not completely um, out there for us to teach. Only a pilot version is available uh, and, and it doesn't have like a exam or anything or the BOH is giving us a, a certificate uh, as a specialist or anything like that. Um, it is something that they provide the training resources and the training providers themselves can create a um, uh, an assessment module and then you know award their own certificate so that's a specialist level but that's still currently in the works so the major component for this now is the intermediate level and leading to the ICERT OH uh, certification so what is ICERT OH now it is an international qualifications uh, framework to recognize the students who have completed all the six modules um, and have been able to demonstrate specific competence in um, industrial or occupational hygiene. So this is like an intermediate level versus your CIH, which is an advanced level certification. Um, so there's a distinction between the two, but both of them need a certain number of uh, hours and requirements, which Shinik is going to talk about for the CIH, for which these BOHS modules um, is a common um, way to, to reach that place. 
So completion of these courses is part of the students training in preparation for ISERT OH, which is the intermediate level and also for eventual progression to chartered occupational hygienist in UK. So if you, if you have some uh, your companies in Europe or it is based in Europe and you want to go that route, you can go after ISERT OH, go to the chartered occupational hygienist or if it is a US based, then you go to the uh, CIH, which is now uh, given by the BGC. Or it can, you know, some other nations also have their own certifying examinations for which these modules would be the base to get there. OK, uh, Lalita, we have one hand raised yeah. in the chat window. Mm -hmm. uh, Roland, you your hand is raised. If you want to ask question, please go ahead. Yeah, ma'am, uh, uh, we are looking at this for seven five hundred series, right? Five zero one to five zero seven. Yeah. Total all in all there are eight series. Yeah. But, uh, is this a five zero four is uh, introduced now recently or it has been there? Yeah. And how many right. of the series uh, we need to clear before going to the certification? Right. We need to clear six, and that would be the next uh, next my next couple of slides where we we'll go we will go into a little bit more details. So need, these are the eight modules that actually are available. Uh, out there on uh, the OHD or OHD has material for uh, all of all those uh, eight modules of which you don't. This is not part of the ISET OH. Out of these, you need six modules and which ones are compulsory and which ones are optional. We will get into the next one. Next slide. Thanks, ma'am. Roland, Thank that makes sense? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. There is one more hand raised by Yunus. Uh, so do you want to ask question? Go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, uh, Salita and Hi. everyone over there. Uh, thanks for briefing this. Uh, uh, the target industry uh, uh, may be a manifold, right? Apart from uh, the hygiene part, this this can be even uh, useful for any manufacturing sectors or any construction industry. Uh, can I just throw some light on this, ma'am? Yeah, the, the, the IH is one towards the certification of IH, but the modules and the content of these courses is, is related to worker health and safety. So whatever industry you are in, um, if you're interested in, in keeping your workers healthy and, you know, uh, safe, even safety people or, or medical doctors or any industry for that matter, they can be exposed to heat, they can be exposed to noise, and you would want to control your exposures. So, you know, whatever industry it is, uh, they would be relevant to that industry. And the, it is okay, taught in more. terms of uh, occupational hygiene principles. So. Nice. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, just to, one more question from my side is that. Uh, uh, you said that there is any formal qualification for this. Any person can do uh, any course. Yeah. This? Yes, any person can do oh. this. So there are no required uh, mandatory prerequisite that someone has to, you know, have a bachelor's or have a mm -hmm. safety degree or anything like that. That's that requirements are not there. Basically, they they didn't want to include that because they want to make this an, an open source thing. So anybody who is interested can 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 learn occupational hygiene and practice it and get um, you know be skilled at it and be qualified at it um the the reason i said that it's better that you do 201 is because the level of expertise that you need to pass the exam and get certified for these you need a certain awareness of what occupational hygiene is about what the uh, you know uh, what the um, the uniqueness of occupational hygiene is about versus say safety or versus a medical uh, physician or anything like that so if you have that kind of a background then it is easy to do the other modules and move towards your certification more efficiently. But formal requirements are not there. That's OK, I understood. I am a, already a, a lead writer and also I do this uh, UK certified British Safety Council uh, level six international uh, Nabosch diploma HSE, which more mm -hmm. talks, talk, talk some topics on hygiene as well. So this is more uh, uh, relevant to the hygiene in detail, I believe. That's yes, it, this yeah. is targeted. Anyway, yeah, this is a targeted uh, audience for hygiene. People who want to get into hygiene from other different fields. 
fine ma'am that's okay thank you and the cost right. other things can we talk about yeah we'll get to, yeah we'll get to that i have i have the that component also coming up uh, at the end of the course thank you. yeah thank one you more for the question from yeah thanks you know are you done you know can we move to next yes okay. yes yes uh, please you can please move yeah uh, there is uh, one more question from vigen kumar go ahead mm. Yeah, begin to unmute your line. Begin. Uh, we are not able to hear. Uh, begin. Okay, probably uh, you will have to check your line till that time. We go to uh, other candidate. Uh, Ebenzer, uh, please sorry, unmute sir. your sorry, line. Sorry, sir. I hope you are able to hear now. Yeah, go ahead. Begin. Yes, my question was uh, 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 there is a CAS and CO, COS from UK and CAS from uh, US. Is there any other certifying countries? Uh, so you mentioned the slide and uh, do we have anything like that in India? Um, yeah, I'm sure Australia has some. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. You want to unmute your line then? Um, yeah, Australia, I believe, has some of uh, their own certification program and some other European countries may have. Um, I'm not sure if India has anything specific for uh, IH like that. Am I right, Srinik? Yeah, India doesn't have anything, uh, but uh, Malaysia. They have uh, some. Okay. Uh, Okay. Is that fine, Vigen Kumar? Can we move to next? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, Ebenzer. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Ebenzer. Go ahead, Ebenzer. We cannot hear you, Ebenzer. Yeah. Can you please be close to the mic and speak loudly, please? Right. Can you hear me now? Hello. A little bit, uh, but go ahead. Okay, so um, I was asking, I, I don't see you do most of the um, asbestos, the W504. Um, is, is there a reason for that? Because I've seen the yeah. slide. Right, Ebenezer. So um, we as Nayati and Rico uh, are not doing asbestos on online format, but if we do have, if there are people uh, interested in asbestos or 504, uh, we can do it in person. And the reason that we have chosen that, uh, you know, intentionally is because we think that the asbestos and fiber scores uh, for online format, especially for uh, practicals, um, we we don't think we can do full justice to that on a on an online format because the practical session uh, showing the asbestos fibers and you know the microscopy, the complexities involved, and all those things are much better understood and learned if it is an in-person course. You know, you you need to actually have your hands on the microscope and and tease the fibers out and uh, uh, use different refractive indices solutions and you know see the color change so it's more complex uh, to show on an online platform versus for example if it is a 501 measurements course or something um, it makes uh, it's not that difficult or that different to show a pump calibration uh, how to put a sampling train for 501 or uh, demonstrating how to take a, a velocity measurements of a of a ventilation system those are not that difficult to uh, understand on an online format but for asbestos i think we uh, it's our opinion actually that we can't do full justice on an online format but you know if we have enough interest uh, we can do it in an in person course Okay, thank you very much. Okay, makes uh, sense. Good, yeah. Uh, thanks, Lalita. I just want to uh, remind you on the time also. Uh, I know, right? Yeah, here. it's uh, I'll probably be running late, but I'm going to uh, pick up the speed now. Yeah, don't rush. Okay, so uh, uh, but right, no, this is actually the important part. No, I won't rush. Um, 
So uh, again, this is the entry level uh, professional qualification uh, certification. And uh, what it does is the, it demonstrates the knowledge and competence in the broad principles and practice of occupational hygiene, which is kind of that is the reason it is the intermediate level as opposed to the advanced level um, certifications. Uh, this is the BOHS uh, website. You can go and um, look at the details of it. BOHS, uh, like Chandrasekhar was asking before, BOHS is the awarding institute, while OHTA is the, uh, you know, it's concerned with the modules, the all the BOHS modules and, you know, all those rules and regulations, while BOHS actually does all your uh, PLP, the personal learning portfolio, the professional discussions and evaluations and awarding the certification. So qualifications guide. Now we are actually coming into what are the requirements for this ICERT OH and what are the different steps involved. Again, we'll try to summarize everything and give you a, 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 an overall picture of this, but there is a clear document that is available online, which is the qualifications guide. And we deal with, uh, you know, for uh, international certification, this is the part that there is a certificate of competence in occupational hygiene, but there is also an international certificate in occupational hygiene, which is what we are interested. Slight differences in the requirements, but we can only qualify for this. So what are the components that we are going to deal, in, deal with now? Uh, one is eligibility and uh, requirements. What do we need? Who is eligible and what is uh, basic requirements are? And then what are the different paths and what are the procedures that are involved in getting to the certification uh, to the end of the process? How long time, how much time is involved? It's a long process. There are different steps involved, but there is also a time limit. So you need to know that so you can manage your time for each step and cost, of course. You know, you need to manage your expenses, spread it out and, and uh, see how to work that out into your budget. So what is the basic requirement? You need to have three years of comprehensive occupational hygiene experience. So this is like a work experience. Um, you need to demonstrate that you are actually doing some kind of IH related activity at your work. Maybe you're doing the, uh, your assessments or assisting somebody during the assessments, taking samples, uh, writing reports or helping write reports that sort of a thing. So you need three years of that. Uh, you probably would need uh, a supervisor's reference to, to uh, as an evidence to show that you do have that kind of an experience. Uh, that is the basic requirement. Uh, and then this is the first one, which we already talked about quite a bit on that, on the OHTA modules. So don't wait on the three years experience to start doing the modules. You can start doing the modules. While you're doing that, you can acquire the years of experience because these take time to complete also, and you can do them simultaneously. So that is the first basic requirement. Now, uh, there was another question before, uh, uh, Roland, I think, uh, what are the different modules and what are the uh, you know differences between them? Out of those eight modules or the seven modules here, four of them are core modules. So you have to have to complete this successfully. Um, there is no option. You need to finish 501, you need to finish 503, 505, and 507. So these are the core required modules. And then the remaining three, two, four, and six, there are optional modules. Out of these three, you can pick any two. So four plus any two will be the six modules that are required to the uh, to be completed to go to the next step. And uh, like I mentioned, 502 and 506 uh, is what we have chosen to do. I'm sure there are training providers who will uh, do 504, uh, you know, if somebody is interested in that. So what are the pathways now? Uh, there are two pathways ex uh, actually. One is path two, which is we are not eligible for that because they need an, uh, an occupational hygiene degree, master's or bachelor's degree from a BOHS recognized institute or academic institute. Uh, and we don't have some, anything like that in India. So even if you have a master's or, a, 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 or any other advanced degree, you still have to choose the path one because we don't have any, uh, you know, relation, any, um, uh, you know, uh, possibility to get a BOHS recognized degree. So the only other option you have is your start first step would be to complete the six two modules, and you have a three years of comprehensive experience as we discussed. Uh, any questions on this? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Yunus here again. Can I have a question? Yes. 
uh this uh, three years experience uh, can mm-hmm. be related to the day to day job which we do in the organization for example i monitor the uh, food safety aspects and the hygiene aspects of the our i work for airport so the airport hygiene the airport uh, yes. uh, you know uh, how can, that can be correlated to that or yeah, it is very yeah, something yeah, yeah. specific that, that would be the experience yes any hygiene related experience on your job on in your industry any industry that you are working yes any hygiene for that matters for example i take of airport hygiene and they put things inside a so the terminal and also the food safety aspects which which more or less talks about mm-hmm. the hygiene part if i'm not wrong yeah right yes anything that, that is to that do with worker safety protein. anything that you are it is connected to protecting workers health and safety in a in a you know like sampling mm-hmm. or you know any protective measures that you are uh, instituting at the airport uh, those sort of things for example we do noise monitoring uh, we yeah, do definitely. ambient air uh, sure mon- yes. monitorings yeah 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 this, this right. can yeah. be converted as a three things okay yes yes yeah you just fine, need to fine. need to need to uh, document those and and submit it in a way that bohs will recognize that as a part of your three years experience okay thank you okay so now you have completed all the six no, modules Yes. Ma'am, I can hear. I have a doubt. Uh, how do they yeah. verify the experience, ma'am? Uh, what sort of documents will have to submit, and what is the review process, approval process? Right. Yeah. So you will have a supervisors. Uh, they will have templates on that. Uh, once you register it, you will get those. Um, you you will describe what you have been doing from which year to which year, uh, how long you have been doing, and what are the actual activities. and your supervisor will attest and say that okay this person has been working with me for this many years or, or doing this particular job so some kind of attestation uh, purposes uh, type of documentation should be there and and i think pinky may be able to ask uh, give you like a like a formal type of document that you need to provide to justify this 3 years of experience so you know uh, i'm sure that will be a good question for her to Um, okay thank you yeah lalita wonderful Pinky. job can you all hear me yes yeah. can you hear me lalita yeah yeah so, yeah sure uh, yeah yeah so as as lalita mentioned uh, you again uh, we again um yes uh, you will receive the format uh, format for you know uh, uh, which your supervisor will have to kind of fill in and c- confirm that you have experience but uh, basically the the professional discussion which is the next part that lalita would be covering i understand is what would actually evaluate um your experience as well so the professional discussion is designed in a way to make sure that um uh, the questions do come to a point where they kind of you demonstrate that you have all that experience that is required so it is a kind of a direct submission to prove but then the indirect way of confirming on how your breadth and depth of knowledge uh, would be the professional discussion which would be the later part um but yeah more than happy to submit and uh, provide you with anything that would help you uh, we can talk about it later once uh, lalita uh, is you know done with her uh, talk because she is covering everything that you would need so if you still have questions we'll get back to it later thanks pinky Uh, so uh, the next level will be the oh, you, okay. Uh, now you have. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I was thanking uh, for your response. Okay, yeah, uh, right. Like sure, the thanks. Uh, I have a doubt also. I'll ask in uh, at the later stage of the. Yeah. So so now you have completed you. all your six modules and you know your application has been approved and everything. So the next step would be to uh, the personal learning portfolio, which is again a. a comprises of a different uh, components within it so what is a personal learning uh, portfolio in short it's called as the plp so it's a record of candidates workplace learning practical experience skills and development so you still have to show bohs um, after completing the modules that um, the knowledge that you have learned from these modules you are actually applying it in your workplace and how they are useful and what you have learned is you are actually using it uh, in, in your uh, job so but you do have to provide some kind of a documentation that uh, to to bohs to show that this is the evidence and i am using this module knowledge uh, in this particular way 
So it is a portfolio of collection of evidence that demonstrates the breadth and depth of practical um, occupational hygiene experience. And it is connected to the six modules that you have actually, uh, let's say, mastered in. So what kind of evidence and documentation do you need for this PLP uh, before you submit? You need experience records, you need uh, evidence of additional learning, and you also need occupational hygiene reports. Um, and we'll go into these, what they actually are. So experience record is again of the practical applications of these six modules that you have learned the knowledge from that, how you are applying it in your job, uh, in your workplace for each each particular module, if noise, how you're applying, controls, how you're applying, measurements, how you're applying, that sort of a thing. So you'll need to have a document for each uh, category of, or each uh, module in place. Uh, for example, how are you using that information in surveys or in, in assessments or in sampling, uh, report writing and so forth? And uh, the number of records that you need to um, provide it is uh, evidence, the experience record evidence from five to ten. You need a minimum of five and a maximum of ten records and they should be all uh, e at least one each from each of the core modules. So you will have four for one each of the modules and one for the optional module. So that will be five. And if you do have extra ones, maybe you can do a couple more extra, no harm in that. And if one of them is not relevant, they can use the other one uh, to cover for the five because you need a minimum of approved five uh, documents. Now, again, uh, these are not really uh, detailed uh, documentation for that. Uh, again, we'll get when when I'm done. I'm sure Pinky can um, uh, explain uh, more about it. But just to uh, just to go over this uh, very quickly, uh, this is a PLP experience and record uh, record example. You'll find this in the uh, qualification guide. So it includes like what is your role. For example, if you're doing, a, if this is about a thermal environment, W502 module, you're providing evidence for, uh, then what is the project? It is about a heat survey, heat stress survey in a, a smelter. When you do this and what type of uh, uh, job was it actually? And you were doing a walkthrough survey. Um, what was the scope? And uh, what was your personal involvement? What have you actually done? How are you actually involved in this particular uh, project for this particular module? Uh, and which course module does the survey or the project relate uh, to thermal environment? And also if it is relevant to asbestos, maybe it's some insulation material that you're studying. And if you did any asbestos survey uh, in relation to uh, you know uh, thermal stress, uh, you know, how are both related? Is it applicable in your job work? That sort of a thing. And limitations with the survey project. So if a survey was only connected on one day, ambient temperature was low, senior form foreman was on sick leave. So any kind of limitations or any kind of comments basically on, on that particular project uh, for that particular module. And any problems that you have encountered, it says here exposed asbestos uh, lagging was identified when you were doing the survey and you had to immediately, uh, you know, uh, instigate a control measure. And then, of course, your manager and, uh, uh, sorry, and your manager uh, uh, recommendations or references and so forth. So this is for 502 module. So this is like a detailed one and you have a template available and then you fill it out uh, as relevant as possible. So this way you will have other four modules for the other, uh, uh, I mean other four uh, uh, documents for the other modules and at least one each for each core module. So that's the first evidence of experience evidence. The second evidence you need would be for the additional learning um, uh, evidence for the uh, subject. So here it, there is a bigger scope for this. It's not so as narrow as just the four core modules are required. You can include the core modules also, but then this is more like you are, you are doing your continuing education in the process. So any meetings you are at, not meetings like admin meetings, but technical, you know, subject related meetings. If you have taken any courses on the way, uh, other than the BOHS courses, any conferences that you attended, any technical papers that you have studied uh, relevant to uh, you know, your work and how that research paper or that article material in that, uh, you were able to apply it to your job work, uh, that sort of a thing. Same thing here, you also need a minimum of five and maximum of 10. You can include the core modules, but you know, you can include other areas also. 
this is also a similar um, uh, short template. Doesn't have to be uh, very detailed in picture. Uh, for example, here you have the attended a meeting which is managing asbestos in the premises and what date, what location, what were the learning outcomes, you know, what was covered in there. So covered the new HSE guidance, uh, how to manage asbestos in buildings and did you learn anything from it, any regulations that you need. You can also attach a program sheet or a brochure or, you know, anything related to what you, if it was a paper, for example, a technical paper, you can write who the authors are. Uh, you know, like an abstract of it, or attach the paper and, you know, things like that. So that is the second evidence. So you have the experience record evidence and additional learning record evidence. Um, not very detailed, but still you need to keep a, keep track of those things. And the last one, this is an important one, and it is also uh, more extensive. Um, this is an actual occupational hygiene report. Again, uh, at the end of mine, uh, I can probably you know, Pinky can probably tell you more about how to uh, how to manage this because this is this is an integral part, important part of your PLP documentation. So you need three such occupational hygiene reports, which is a real actual occupational hygiene report, which includes the survey, your real measurements, real numericals, how you analyzed it, um, you know, how you wrote it, uh, an actual hygiene report, and so forth. It it'll be it's an extensive. Uh, report and you need three of those reports. What is the purpose of this? Each report should demonstrate an all round competence in uh, your occupational hygiene practice. And the, out of the three, uh, there are some requirements here. It should contain uh, what that hazard is, what is the health effect on that, how you have evaluated and any control measures that you have recommended or you have put in place or evaluated if the controls are working or not, that sort of a thing. So you should include the real measurement data, assessment, interpretation of the results and discussion. So it is a it is a uh, it's a lengthy uh, process and a good uh, serious uh, in-depth documentation that you have to write and an important part of the PLP. Oops, sorry. So the purpose of this is to whether uh, assess whether the candidate can write competent occupational hygiene reports to include all the essential elements. And what are the three uh, uh, reports uh, should be? One should be the first one. It should cover more uh, material from 501, 505, and 507. So this is your assessment and measurements of any particular hazard. And this is the controls part of it. And this is the health effect part of, uh, part of the uh, hazard. So one report should have all of these in a detailed way. The other should be just by noise itself. Address all of these, but for noise. And the third one can be any other topic, ergonomics or asbestos, thermal, or biological hazards, or any other topic. So you need three different reports, which will cover all these three aspects in a detailed way. And then at the end of it, you should also submit a certificate of authorship. There is a template available on the website. You can download it. Basically, what you're saying is, you know, you haven't, taken this report from some place like plagiarized it or you know someone wrote it for you or anything like that you are you are uh, authenticating that it is you who are the author and you have written it and they will be assessing you for that um, so like i said since this is a detailed rep report you will need a lot of for help on this. There is also a very good report, a very good document that is available on the website, clear and concise report writing guidance for occupational hygienists. And um, um, again, this includes, uh, this is not just for you, any occupational hygienist who wants to write a report, it's a, it's a good document as to what should be involved, what your objectives are, who the reader is, who you are you writing it for. You want to write it for a worker, uh, employee, you will write it in a different way. If you're going to write it for a regulator, you'll probably include some other uh, language there. Uh, you know, you don't want to make it too technical for a worker, so he won't understand what you're talking about. The language, if you're, you know, how, how concise and how clear and how well you're writing. Uh, organizing it, what is the quality of it and how you're presenting it. If you have your measurement data and you have all these numbers, I mean, do you have a good graphic uh, representation, you know, charts and visuals and, you know, uh, of your uh, assessment, you have photographs, you have any video that you can um, uh, include it in the presentation, that sort of a thing. And finally, you should have, uh, you know, a summary of it. Uh, you know, what are your objectives and what are the results? What are your conclusions um, and uh, what are your 
recommendations and legal uh, you know if uh, any of those aspects are involved any uh, requirements uh, legally required in that particular report. So this is a very good document. Uh, you might want to download it and keep it handy if you are uh, planning to pre prepare a PLP report to submit. So in summary, you have um, three requirements, three evidence. One is uh, experience record, five to ten, additional learning record, five to ten, short template like things, and occupational hygiene reports, three of them. So once are all of these are ready, You'll have to upload on the website uh, and then submit it. Um, there are different uh, requirements, technical requirements that you want to submit. Once you submit it, if everything goes OK, they will be accepted and then you will go to the last part of it, which is professional discussion. If you are not accept, if, if they find some deficiencies uh, in the report, they will come back and give you recommendations to upgrade or amend or corrections or they, they will give you suggestions and you know uh, how to improve on it. And you are allowed to resubmissions to, 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 to get it accepted. And I believe there is also some other, uh, you know, if, if you need even much more help in that, there, you know, there is probably like a paid service, give it to a senior examiner who will actually give you more directions on how to write the personal learning portfolio. So this is a very important part after you complete your six modules. So the last part is the professional discussion. This is the final component of the certification process. Once you're finished and you're, you got an email from them saying that, okay, your PLP is approved, then you book online for a professional discussion. This is actually the purpose is to assess if the candidate has necessary skills, um, necessary skills to apply the knowledge that you have studied in all those modules to real life situations. So it's not like technical information from the manual, from the subject. It's not like you want to go back and review all the material in the student manual, but it is more how you're using it in the scenarios, in a real life situation. So it's a discussion. It's like a viva when you're doing a master's or a PhD um, thesis. So it is not to retest your technical knowledge or not to assess if your current job performance is good or not. So it's, it's just a one-on-one -on -one discussion uh, with the candidate to see in depth how much this person actually knows, but again, based on the basis of the modules that you have studied. So what is the format for this professional discussion? You book online after the PLP is approved. It's a 60 minute duration online video conference and BOHS will pick examiners. There will be three examiners. Uh, one of them will be the chair of the panel and then the rest of them too. So, you know, you'll be one on one this, with these people. It's like an interview basically. It will test, you know, they may come up with a scenario and ask you what you're going to do if such and such a thing happened and so forth. Again, at the end of my talk, Pinky can probably add a lot more. She has been through this. Uh, and, you know, good thing like Pinky is both ISOH and CIH. So she can kind of tell you what the differences are and, you know, how difficult one is over the other or not. So what are the subjects that are covered in the professional discussion? You have four core uh, modules, like we said, and two optional ones, which is your six modules that you have chosen to do based on re real life situations, scenarios, hazards, and how you're really in practical uh, situations. You're able to uh, judge, make judgments, and assess the situation and take actions. It is to ability to analyze the problem and recognize the hazards and carry out practical assessments and understand control me mechanics and assess the controls. So uh, once the date is fixed and you have all the discussions with the, with the panel, if you're successful, you'll get an email notification that you know, gives you the certificate and yeah, you're done. But if you're not, you'll get a feedback again and they may give you like a, some deficiencies where you have to improve and then you have a chance to take two attempts similar to the PLP. You have a chance to resubmit twice. You also have a chance to resubmit, uh, re rebook professional discussion twice uh, if you're not able to make it. So the next important thing is the timeline. Uh, I'm almost done, Srinik, maybe just another 10 minutes. Uh, the timeline uh, is 18 months from the date of the, the date your application is approved. So first, the very first thing you would do would be to apply online, uh, showing that you have three years of experience and showing that you have passed all the six modules and you're eligible to get into the next process of uh, uh, ISAT-OH uh, procedure. So once from that date, once you get an email saying that, okay, now you are approved to go to the next step, from then on you have 18 months to complete 
this whole process up to you know final uh, professional discussion. So um, our advice and also this is the feedback from BOHS is that you don't apply first initially and wait for them to come uh, to uh, say that the application is approved and then start your PLP. You start your PLP documentation from the day you actually start doing your BOHS modules or OHTA modules. For each module, you start making your record right away immediately. Start writing your reports. So when you're ready to apply, you should have already finished all your modules and your PLP should be almost ready to be submitted with everything in place. So then as soon as you get the approval for the application, maybe in the next few days or so, you are ready to submit the PLP. So that way you're not losing time. So if you just apply now, get your approval and then start doing your PLP documentation, it won't be easy. It's a long, you know, a longer uh, time consuming process. So you'll be losing several months in that and you may not be able to finish it. So that's what is suggested. So those of you who have already completed your BOHS modules now and you are planning to do ISET OH, so you would want to start right away uh, all the uh, PLP documentation. OK, so register the BOHS. It, it includes the 18 months will include from the time the application is uh, approved to PLP. And if it is PLP is accepted, it's fine. Otherwise, resubmissions professional discussion, resubmission. So all of these should be done within 18 months. Now, uh, question, the last, uh, the cost of it, as somebody was saying, uh, this is again what the current prices are. It may vary, uh, varies depending on the conversion rates. Uh, they may be increasing, updating the fee and all those. So application, there is no fee. Uh, for personal learning portfolio is 155 pounds. Uh, so we just calculated, rounded it off to 100 rupees per pound uh, because it's like 99 or 98 something now. Um, so this would be about 15,500 rupees. Um, for PLP resubmissions, there is no additional fee. So this covers the two re resubmissions. Once you have succeeded in this, then you'll book online. So you'll have to pay this. Whenever you book for something, you'll have to pay for that through online. Uh, professional discussion is 400 pounds, which will again 40,000, but this will cost you every time you book another discussion, they will charge you uh, a reapplication fee. Uh, OHTA six modules, this is just an estimate. It depends on you know who you're going with and so forth. Uh, this again, assuming that you're passing all the modules in the first uh, sitting because you can reset for BOHS uh, re exam, but there will be an additional exam fee if you failed one subject and you want to retake the exam. So all of this assume that everything is done in the first shot and you're successful. So a total cost would be about uh, 2 lakhs 35, 36,000 for the whole process. Uh, like I said, assuming it's all in the first sitting. Now there is also what is the uh, what they told us is the is an international membership uh, uh, in the BOHS the organization BOHS which is uh, 25 pounds per year or 2,500 rupees per year, and that will give you access to what is called as a mentoring program. Now in this mentoring program they will give you additional assistance if you think it's worth it you can get a membership. They will give you additional uh, assistance uh, in preparing for the PLP and in preparing for the professional uh, discussion and so forth. So that is the last uh, part of the uh, part of the requirement. Your six modules, uh, PLP, under PLP, you have uh, experience record, additional learning records, and the OH reports. Of order, all these are submitted and it is approved and assessed. Then you do your professional discussion and then you're done. Get the certificate. Um, this is just the pathways. Uh, there is a hub actually, and it can lead you. You can set up an account um, and then submit everything online, pay fees online, and um, uh, you know, access guidance, more documentation if you need, whatever needs to be submitted, any templates that are there that are available um, and those kinds of things. Um, yeah, so that takes care of uh, the ICERT OH. Uh, if any questions you have for me, uh, I can answer. Or uh, Srinik, if time is uh, limiting, you Very can. Common, yeah. yeah. No, we will take some questions. So go ahead, Chandrasekhar. Yeah, Chandrasekhar. Yeah. Uh, Lalita, I have a couple of questions uh, regarding the, the PDC, the professional development course you talked about. So in that, uh, as you said, for the evaluation, we need to uh, upload whatever the professional development courses besides the uh, BOHS model that we can upload. 
for the for their evaluation and uh, that uh, uh, now uh, whenever we are doing any professional development course it comes with some certain credit hours also so whether the bohs is evaluating based on how much uh, uh, the weightage for that particular course or the meeting uh, how that the evaluation will be and no uh, secondly, for additional yeah for additional learning record i don't think the hours or anything it, it doesn't take into consideration the uh, hours or the cm points or anything like that it is just it's just the event if you attended a conference that is that is an additional learning record uh, maybe a session in that that would be an additional uh, re learning record um, and you don't have to yeah. attach uh, I, I guess you can just attach the brochure of it or the the um, you know uh, content of that or abstract of that um, that should be enough uh, am i right pinky yeah, so the format also requires you to uh, include what you have learned out of it and uh, me being one of the evaluators. So I am I evaluate the PLPs that people submit on behalf of BOHS. So it, it does uh, expect you to kind of specify on what you have learned out of it from that event. Now it could be an event. It could be also reading of uh, some uh, technical papers or anything such. It's just what you have pulled out of that specific uh, thing and how it has added to your knowledge uh, of occupational hygiene. It doesn't take into consideration the hours that you attended. That's okay. right. Yeah, yeah, no, it does not. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And secondly, ma'am, uh, one more thing is that uh, what is the validity? I mean, if at all I have completed this PDC, say, in the year 2021, and I'm going for ISWERT uh, OH in the year 2000, that is the next year, 2023, whether the 21, uh, uh, this thing, the, that particular validity will be there, for uh, after the say one and a half years or two years mm, i don't know that's a pinky question oh. no there is no specific guide guidance or standard uh, to it but again it would be within your you know three years which you are considering as your experience portfolio because basically what you are trying to demonstrate is your uh, learning so that learning is within that three years uh, timeline so anything within that three okay. years should be fine as i said there is no specific timeline so that should be fine Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, begin, Kumar. Go uh, ahead. Ma'am, I have a doubt. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, ma'am, for the article learning, you have mentioned it is uh, meetings, training courses. Can we include our uh, uh, any standard rollouts or procedure rollouts uh, within the organization itself or only those international conference or national level conferences is allowed, uh, accepted? Hmm. I'd, I'd divert that to Pinky also. Well, if it's a learning for you in terms of occupational hygiene, it should be OK. It, it does not require an international conference or a national conference. As I said, even if you have hmm. uh, read a technical paper from the Annals of Workplace or the Exposure magazine, that should also be fine. You just need to demonstrate that you have learned from it. Okay, uh, that is great. Uh, understood. And uh, is, is it still okay to share data of uh, the organization? Because uh, in one point, we, uh, it was informed that uh, we need to share uh, measurement data, real-time measurement data. Uh, what if the company is not permitting us to uh, share the uh, data externally? Yeah, uh, Pinky? Uh, well, I think to demonstrate that you have conducted that assessment, you would need to submit the data. Now, if I talk about my experience, I submitted this when I was a consultant. So I submitted it saying uh, an ABC company, you know, I did this work at a certain company without naming the name of the company and the location, and you're just submitting the data. Again, BOHS has its own uh, confidentiality agreement with all the evaluators as well. So even if you are sharing something with BOHS, it does not go out anywhere other than the evaluator. And when it's evaluator, he, he or she doesn't get the name of the person who's submitting the PLP. It, he, just, he or she just receives the technical details or your uh, you know, experience records and your additional learning records. So uh, I don't think so there should be an issue, but uh, you, you need to submit the learning portfolio or the report with the measurements. The BOHS would expect you to have the numbers into it. You can remove the other uh, information as in the location, the address, the name, etc. Because that is how you would demonstrate. You. Without the numbers, you won't be able to 
uh, talk about whether the numbers were high, how enough, whatever, you know, how your your interpretation of the results, how did you work on the control of uh, the hazard, if at all it was high. So I, uh, you would require the numbers to go in there. Does that answer your question? Uh, true. Yeah, uh, that answered my question very well. Ma and uh, I, I do have another question. Uh, uh, there is a minimum requirement to complete three years of comprehensive experience in industrial hygiene. Uh, for example, if I'm uh, uh, changing my uh, employment with a new company, and if there is, if I'm working only for like a year. So do I need to submit uh, uh, from a different super, I means two, three company supervisors? Is, is it also accepted? Like, uh, for example, I'm currently working for ABC company uh, just from last six months. Before that, I was working for a different company where I have served uh, like uh, two or three years of industrial hygiene experience. So from which employer should I uh, should I uh, submit the experience record? Yeah, from from each one, you know, like based on the three years, you can you can split your three years from which year to or which year, which month at this particular company at this particular supervisor. And your next is, you know, whoever this other ABC company or uh, XYZ company. Um, so combine, you know, they should all amount, uh, they should all add up to three years, whoever, wherever you are. Oh, with the okay. respective supervisors. Uh, well, with yeah, actually my doubt was like, uh, can, can my uh, uh, current company supervisor endorse my previous uh, company's experience also, or do I need to approach the previous company? Yeah, it has to, to be whoever your, whoever your supervisor is for that particular duration. It has to be your your current company doesn't know what you worked in a different company, right? I mean, your your supervisor yes, for that particular uh, job for that duration has to attest that for that particular uh, period. Okay, and and one more doubt also. Uh, in any case, if the supervisor is not available, can I approach uh, uh, the department head or uh, someone who is superior to him, or uh, do I need to get from the line supervisor itself? Whoever, whoever is aware of your work, whoever is, uh, whoever knows that you are actually doing this, um, I, I think should be fine. I mean, he should know, or he or she should know that you are actually doing that work, and you know, um, part uh, responsible for that particular job for that duration. Yes, sir. Okay. Very clear. Thank you. Lalita, ma'am, yeah, uh, this one question from me. Uh, one yes, and Okay, let him, let him yeah. go ahead. No problem. Mm. Uh, hold on. Uh, so one, we go from one, one by one. Uh, Dr. Uh, Muji, go ahead. Yeah, yeah go ahead. So, uh, you talk about uh, each co <clears throat> course will take 40, hour, 40 hours of the duration. So this 40 hours would be in a month or uh, uh, two months or three months. How you will going to conduct the programs uh, to complete all these six uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, course uh, programs uh, and uh, apart from the optional programs. So it will take how much time in a year we will close all the courses or how it will be. OK, so um, right now, if you do the online format, uh, each course for us, we take about nine to 10 days. Uh, and if you're doing, uh, we <coughs> work in the evenings or we conduct our, our schedule is in the evenings from 6.30 to 11 p.m. every night. Uh, and that's like nine to 10 days uh, for each course. Uh, it will add up to 40 or 45 hours. Um, so each course will be a 10 day course uh, after hours um online format which includes your practicals and there is an online exam and all of those things together uh, each course has to be 40 to 45 hours and um, it depends the frequency it, it depends on on you uh, we uh, again in their other training providers may have other different schedules but we are offering one uh, course every alternate month so if you're successful for the first time in all the modules then in one year you can finish six modules it depends on when you start. Okay, got Does it. Does it answer? Uh, Lalitha, can I take one question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, see, yeah, like uh, CIH, it is 
yeah cih actually it is a worldwide ac uh, acceptable recognition that is what i suppose uh, so this isot uh, oh uh, whether it is uh, equivalent or uh, it is uh, uh, it is acceptable across the globe or it is just uh, limited to eu countries uh, no as far as an isot oh also is is a globally recognized certificate uh, it's an intermediate level where cih would be an advanced level um so that's the only difference but it is approved or accepted recognized um, all over i mean uk okay. probably Thanks. knows it more about it even exam for example in indian countries where the i mean sorry in india where uh, some of the corporations have their main offices uh, you know uh, like uk based companies they might want uh isato h as a preference just for policy sake or something uh, but it is globally recognized as an intermediate yeah. level certification yeah thanks man okay um shinik back to you perfect uh, thank you very much uh, lalita uh let me know there is some uh, okay uh Mujib, your hand is raised. Do you have any question? No, over. Thanks, Shrink. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, we have invited uh, Pinky Butt uh, for uh, giving some insightful information on the personal learning portfolio and the uh, preparation. So, uh, Pinky, uh, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Shani. Um, yeah. so I, I do not have any slides to share with you. Basically, the, the information that you would receive from BOHS was all uh, very well uh, explained and described by Lalita. So I would just add a, one or two points to it and then maybe just talk about what I did for my preparation. Um, so in terms of documentation, uh, they would uh, the BOHS would uh, expect a minimum of five documents as a as a total uh, of experience records and your additional learning records from you and a maximum of 10 is allowed now because i'm also on the board of bohs and uh, the faculty of committee i know that uh, they have limitations in terms of uh, you know dedicating time for each of the plp review and all of those so that is why the limitations in terms of a maximum documentation that you could uh, upload as a part of your personal learning portfolio um one of the tip i can say is uh, the more you submit the more questions related to those things would be could be expected in your uh, pers um, professional discussion now the plp assessments may be shared with the panel uh, the three uh, the three the three professional discussion panel that that those people so there are chances that the you you may receive questions uh, from your plp it does not mean that you will definitely receive uh, you have you know they are kind of the the intention is to assess you so there are chances that they would pick up something from what you have submitted as a plp now what do you submit in a plp uh, try to try to look at it from the bohs uh, point of view what they are trying to assess is what is your breadth and depth of occupational hygiene as Lalita mentioned. So the, ma the main um, four modules. Now, what is occupational hygiene? You evaluate, uh, you identify, you evaluate and you control. So what was your approach? What was your role in identifying those hazards? Whatever the four main and the two uh, subsequent optional that you have taken. What did you do to evaluate? How did you evaluate? How did you interpret those results? How did you communicate those results? And were there any actions taken to control? Now, considering the role of an occupational hygiene or a hygienist on site or a safety professional who's trying to also do occupational hygiene, you may not have always um, you know, examples that the hazard was 100% controlled by whatever, you know, engineering controls or hierarchy of controls that you would have taken. What they are trying to assess is, have you understood that you require control? Did you take any measures? Did you communicate it to the stakeholders, for example? Did you interpret the results correctly? Did you use the correct method 
to evaluate and to quantify the hazards. How did you approach to your hazards? So let's say heat stress. So evaluation of heat stress. Uh, again, if you follow the module, there is qualitative, quantitative. Um, uh, I did my heat stress with Lalita and Shrenik, and I remember they had a very thorough uh, demonstration of all the um, equipment and everything. So basics of occupational hygiene for each of the modules is what is expected from your personal learning portfolio. Um, your one report can cover chemicals and heat or heat and noise or chemicals and noise. You don't need to submit five or six different reports for each of your modules. Uh, there is no specific requirements. Uh, your report, again, uh, as Lalita mentioned, the very good document that BOHS has in terms of a writing report. Your report should start with or should include objective. What was your objective of conducting an assessment? Why did you conduct that assessment? Uh, your scope, your methodology, your uh, evaluation criteria, your results, your interpretation, conclusion. So everything is mentioned in the document, very detailed. You don't want a 500 page report, you, a 50 page report, or even a 20 page report, which is very clear, very concise and precise with all the required information should be fine. BOHS is not looking for lengthy reports. They are looking for quality reports as a part of your personal learning portfolio. If the PLP is unacceptable, which will not be a surprise, there are many, many chances that the PLP is, is returned with some kind of questions, and it just means that either they need more information for th those specific reports or something is lacking in that reports, and BOHS will communicate it directly to you that your report ABC is lacking X, Y, and Z. Can you please include that? Um, so, and there could be some technical errors, for example, that, uh, you know, it seems that uh, uh, the, the methodology here does not seem to be right. Do you have any additional example for this specific module? And you might want to go back and submit something else, uh, which you would have done. Uh, so it's not a surprise. I got my report, one of my reports back with additional questions. You just have to uh, provide clarification, make changes into that report and resubmit it for evaluation. Uh, they have very strict quality st uh, criteria in terms of evaluation. I did not know that earlier, but now I'm going through that training phase on how do you evaluate a PLP. So I know that it is it, it has a very specific requirement uh, in, in all of those as well. Uh, additional learning, there was a question. So what I submitted in additional learning was um, uh, some technical papers, some uh, some articles from Annals of Occupational Hygiene, uh, Exposure uh, Magazine, Synergist Magazine, which is from American Industrial Hygiene Association, something related to occupational hygiene, which will directly or indirectly be related to what some of your modules because the modules are basics of occupational hygiene. So, you know, very specifically mentioned, this article from this, um, uh, uh, you know, what do you call, uh, a magazine, uh, this issue, uh, the article was written by this and it talked about ABCD. This is what I learned from it. If you have any doubts, again, you know, I, I would have appreciated getting more information on this. I will try to get it something, whatever. So what what POHS is looking is what you got out of it, clarity. And and it is perfectly all right to include that uh, the limitations. Um, if you remember, Lalita did provide some very good examples of limitations in terms of your uh, uh, submissions, for example, your report that you have submitted. Uh, limited time was available. The contractor or the consultant uh, who was supporting us for asbestos survey uh, was, uh, you know, uh, was available only for two days. Uh, it was raining, so we had to cancel and we redid it. Whatever, whatever uh, limitations you had faced, add it into it. BOHS is not looking for something perfect. It is looking for what you actually did. What was your approach to it? There is nothing that could be perfect in terms of an assessment. There will be something that is missed out. There will be something which was 
falling short or there will be some limitation and it is perfectly all right. POHS is expecting you to communicate what actually happened because that will directly or indirectly lead to the professional discussion, which would be the next part of it. Are we all right till now? I see some hands. Shrenik? We are all right. Uh, there, are, there are no questions. Mujib uh, raised his hand is from previous one. OK, okay. you can go I ahead. Think... OK, OK, so. <clears throat> uh, uh, I will talk about the reports that I had submitted. For example, I had submitted for chemical exposure and heat stress. Um, there were limitations in the reports that I submitted. For example, um, the sampling media uh, did not reach on time. So even though the scope, because the scope included, let me finish this, the scope included certain chemicals to be monitored, but then I could not include one of those or I could not conduct monitoring for that because the sampling media got stuck in the uh, customs and I did not receive it. Because when you submit your report, they will start with the objective of what what you what was the objective of that specific survey. Now, if the if the survey said conduct exposure assessment for volatile organic compounds at um, let's say at a refinery. So then you would definitely want to talk about all the VOCs that are potentially um, hazardous in that that working atmosphere that could be for example benzene tolvin most of the solvents you can man, uh, you can monitor from a uh, uh, charcoal tube there may be one or two specific vocs which may require some different uh, uh, sampling media and the same thing happened for me the, if i did not mention that limitation that the sampling media got stuck in the customs there would have been a question coming back well uh, uh, um, a refinery would have A, B, C, D, E, which you can uh, monitor from uh, using a charcoal. But then what about X, Y, and Z, which you did not monitor? Did you miss it? So to clear that, you know, I had to include, which was the truth. So think up, think when you, when you write your PLP and when you are submitting it, think on the point of view from BOHS on what are the questions that could arise. Am I completing the circle? Am I, com am I providing them the objective? Now, what I have come, what I have conducted in terms of assessment, is it meeting meeting the uh, objective? Is there a gap? If there is a gap, why is that gap? And then provide justification for it. As I mentioned earlier, BOHS is not looking for perfection. There could be gap. Just provide what was the just uh, what was the gap? Why did that gap occur? What was the limitation? And that is all that you need to do. You know, heat stress, for example. Uh, I had first submitted a heat stress assessment, assessment which was unfortunately conducted uh, when, you know, uh, it was not the right time. For example, it was somewhere in October and November, but that was the only report at that point of time that I had to submit. So I said, well, at, it was conducted in October and November, so it was not representative of the actual heat stress that could have occurred uh, uh, during, you know, that could, uh, that the, the operators could be exposed during summer season, for example. So then that was the gap that I had identified. What was my approach? Well, the, the, the client wanted, because as I said, I was a consultant at that point of time, the client wanted me to conduct it as soon as possible. So we did do it in October, November, but then we also, in, we also very clearly communicated that this is not representative and then we should be doing additional assessment during the summer season. So we went back on the summer season and we collected, uh, we conducted additional monitoring. This is the report. So it actually tells you that you understand that basically what, when is the heat stress at its peak or when is a person exposed? It's during, of course, in India, May, June, July. So if I'm conducting an assessment in November and December, I need to identify that gap that it was not representative. And then what did I do to fill that gap? You know, so that is how I uh, I, I uh, proceeded. But then, as I said, I had one report that came back to me from the assessor. Now, it would not be assessor who will come back to you. You will not know who the assessor is. The assessor would not know whose PLP I am reviewing. So that is the confidentiality part. Um, so the assessor will review the PLP and it will go to the BOHS exam committee. The, the feedback will go to the BOHS exam committee. 
And if there are any additional information or any questions, then BOHS exam committee will get in touch with you that these are the questions the assessor have or this report has this technical errors. Can you can you re review it? Can, do you want to make some changes? And then that will go as resubmission. As Lalita mentioned, you can have two resubmissions or your, your timeline is 18 months, either of them. Uh, after 18 months, your PLP uh, will be, you know, it will kind of uh, be forfeited and you will have to redo. Your application will lapse and the submission and assessment fee you will have to redo after 18 months or the two resubmissions, whatever is applicable. Uh, well, that is all from my side, yeah, unless there are questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Pinky. We have one question from Vigen Kumar. Uh, go ahead, Vigen. Uh, yes, uh, so, yes ma'am. Uh, actually, uh, 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 I have a doubt. Like, uh, for example, uh, uh, this summer we did uh, noise measurements in our organization, uh, but I haven't completed the noise module yet. So maybe uh, by the next year uh, I will be completing it. Can I submit this uh, uh, last year's data or analysis reports, whatever I prefer uh, uh, for the later studied uh, modules? Is that will that be acceptable? Because in my report I'll mention this was done in 2021 or uh, sorry 2022 in uh, for the report where, where, uh, that I'm going to submit in 2023. Uh, will that be still uh, acceptable? Mm, good question. I don't see any issue other than Shrenik and Lalita. If you have any any um, comment on it, it should still meet what you have learned from uh, your noise module. Uh, I can get back to you, Vigen Kumar. I'll get back to Shrenik uh, after cross-checking it with uh, BOHS. Uh, maybe yeah. next week or so, as soon as I see. I, I don't I don't see any issue. But I would still want to confirm it once with BOHS. Yeah, same here. I don't see any issue with that either. So. OK, ma'am. Uh, uh, thank you. And if you can get any feedback, uh, uh, please share with us later stage. Yeah, yeah. And, so if, uh, if it is if it is the other case, Vigen Kumar, if it is the case that it should it would be effective, like, you know, you need to have your module done and then only do the do the uh, project or do the report, then I will come back to you. If it's the other way around, if it's not affecting, then that is what I understand and that is what Lalita understands as well. So uh, then it, it's that that is what it is, but I'll still confirm with BOHS. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Pinky. And uh, when you were not there, Pinky, initially I introduced you uh, with the participants and that is what I was showing your introduction on the slide. I know uh, you have traveled from uh, UK to India and you have still have a jet lag. So uh, thank you so much uh, for sparing this time and giving your valuable insight. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Uh, I will be now continuing with CIH. Uh, if you would like to stay, you can stay. Otherwise, I understand uh, you need to take some rest also. No problem, Shrenik. I'll just take one more minute. Being being now uh, again, you know, BOHS faculty committee member, I would really um, uh, encourage you to use the mentorship program from BOHS that will actually give you access to so many people with many, many years of experience in occupational hygiene. And that will actually will, uh, you know, give you very insight, very, very good insight in terms of submitting your PLP on your approach and everything so if if that helps and that would definitely help you so uh, try and do that use the mentor mentorship program on bohs and you have a choice and a variety of um, mentors available uh, on the bohs mentorship program platform there perfect uh, i think we have one last question from yunus uh, go ahead yunus yeah, hello, Pinky. It was a nice explanation. Only two, three doubts from my side is that even the hygiene can be considered like, you know, uh, a dust control measures or, you know, uh, what is that? Uh, uh, for example, we do a lot of uh, uh, housekeeping activities at the terminal to a very high level at various places. Um, uh, these sort of things can, al can also be considered in the report. 
Well, if it's related to occupational hygiene, yes. You know, if it's related yeah. to hygiene only, I would still um, want to add something related to occupational hygiene along with it. Dust control measure, yes, uh, definitely. Uh, dust control measure would be included as occupational hygiene. So yes, but then again, you need to go to the basics of uh, you know evaluation. What was the hazard? How did you control it? And then what was the outcome? And also at a larger capacity, uh, where example, we are having some pipelines laying down for a gas connection from Gale. That is, uh, a government of India is giving some gas connections to the terminal for, for that the pipeline should come from a nearby um, bank to our our area while while doing so all uh, uh, it is getting crossed with a lot of villages and nearby people so con considering the uh, safety of that particular villages we did a lot of fire risk assessment and uh, other safety risk assessment uh, that can be also a part of hygiene assessment because the dust and uh, uh, other things may go there and uh, damage the crops or whatever it may be so how that can be converted to a hygiene part and uh, that can be shown as a report right occupational hygiene yes yeah fine then. thanks for the clarity okay. Wonderful. Uh, thank, thank you, you so much. Thanks, Pinky. Really appreciate. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, now we are going into the CIH exam preparation overview. Uh, I am going to take this session probably for next 30 minutes of the time. In case if you have any question in between, uh, please raise your hand or you can put it in a chat window. Uh, Lalita will now moderate uh, that question and answer session, and she will notify me once uh, we have uh, any questions uh, about it. So what are you going to learn at the end of this session? You will be able to know what are the requirements from BGC, that is Board uh, for uh, Global EHS Credential, Previously, uh, it was named as ABIH, that is American Board of Industrial Hygiene. So what are the requirements for CIH? Uh, I will take you through my study plan that I followed when I passed uh, in year 2010. And then what are the useful resources uh, for preparing uh, a CIH examination? <clears throat> uh, I, I, I love to mentor uh, professionals and uh, write references also for them for the CIH examinations if I know their uh, professional background. The first time when I interact with them, uh, their question is, what should I buy? Means uh, which book should I buy? Which uh, data bank CD should I buy? And all I tell them, don't buy many books and the uh, question CDs. You do not need that much of the things. Uh, we will uh, help you out uh, uh, on what are the necessary preferences that you should have, and I have included here. But one thing uh, that I uh, about uh, the question data bank is from the data cam. They, you can go to uh, Google. Uh, you can go to Google and search for data cam CIH uh, exam preparation uh, question. Uh, they give a license version for shorter duration time and for the longer time also. Uh, this is something that I love. Uh, there are around 2000 plus questions. Uh, and once you give an answer, if your answer is wrong or correct, they will give an explanation that why this option is correct. So by that way, you will be able to learn uh, many of the things. So uh, first of all, don't buy many books. Uh, I will take you through those aspects uh, in a couple of minutes. The second thing that I want you to uh, know is that if you prepare well, you will pass the CIH exam. Uh, don't lose the hope. Uh, certain times uh, just before the examination, like you know, today is the uh, 3rd December and 4th December is the examination. The person will become nervous and say that I want to uh, change my examination date and all. Uh, it is OK to get nervous, but don't get afraid. Uh, prepare well, study hard, and then you will have uh, your CIH examination passed successfully. Uh, that's the confidence that I want to build. But for, for passing this exam, you have to start at some point in time. 
So <clears throat> in the CIH examination, there are multiple rubrics are available uh, and in each of the rubrics, which means in each of the subjects, there are particular points that you must have knowledge of those aspects. So uh, I have prepared a kind of uh, uh, the technical terminology for each of the rubrics around 14 to 16 rubrics are there. So in that, what are the important things to read that I have made a list of it? I've given you just here an example of non-engineering control is one of the rubrics for the CIH examination. So in that, what all things comes like eye protection types, the head classifications, headwear classifications, uh, footwear types, uh, hearing protection devices, uh, emergency showers uh, as per the NC standards and all. These are the some of the things that you must have knowledge about uh, this subject. So if you are interested, we will connect in the future. You can send out an email to us. Uh, I will give you that. What are the things that I believe is uh, good to uh, have a knowledge? Additionally, uh, when I prepared for this examination uh, for each of this 14 to 16 rubrics, I prepared a list of uh, references which I need to go through in terms of preparing it. So this is for a, a non-engineering control. The first list was that I should refer the CIH uh, preparation software that is uh, from DataCamp. Then there is a IH reference and study guide from AIH and then in that chapter number 17, then uh, uh, OSHA's respiratory protection program. Then there is a white book also we call it as a, there is an industrial hygiene book. I will show it to you in that chapter number 35 and 36. So I, before starting any subject, I had my own list that OK, to be a competent person in passing this non engineering control rubrics, I should go through all these requirements. Uh, and once I go through all these requirements, probably if any question comes in the non engineering control, I will be able to perform uh, fairly well in this area. So such kind of list you must prepare for each of the rubrics. I have it ready with me. Uh, anyone interested, I will uh, you just drop a note to me. Uh, and then we will send it out to you. <clears throat> OK, so I started, as I said, I started this uh, consulting business in February 2020 and then COVID came up and during that COVID time to survive, I conducted a live IH webinar and in that I received around 50 plus question and answers questions from them. I gave response to each of these uh, uh, questions and then publish it uh, on my LinkedIn page also. So if you are interested uh, for any of those questions, because these questions will be useful to you uh, in the CIH examinations also. So in case if you are interested, you can uh, subscribe to our LinkedIn one, or you can send me the note on the email. I will send out those 50 questions with uh, all the answers that I believe was true at that point in time. So now, all of you are attending this session uh, for some benefit. Now that benefit sometimes is not always uh, the monetary benefit. There can be a personal satisfaction level also, your uh, grade pay, your job uh, pay level, or the your grade level will get increased once you pass the CIH. But the first and foremost uh, benefit of CIH is the professional recognition. Once you are CIH, uh, any company or any professional will see you as a very competent person that yes, this person has a right amount of technical knowledge in the industrial hygiene field, which you can demonstrate as a, your expertise or the competence level also. CIH usually gets higher pay. Uh, now, when you want to compare how much higher pay is, usually you then uh, depends on your experience, the 20 to 25 percent higher pay uh, then the uh, non CIH or the industrial hygienist person. So that is what I have experienced in my professional life when I was working with multinational companies uh, uh, things. Uh, also uh, to keep your CIH degree or certificate with you, you will have to maintain that uh, certificate and every five years you will have to accumulate certain points uh, for the knowledge purpose uh, and submitting it for the recertification. So when you are getting those uh, points uh, by attending some webinar, giving some trainings and all. It gives you some more insightful information about what industry, what is happening in industrial hygiene field, and that is why you will gain more knowledge also. 
And and the benefits of CIH is it is faster than the graduate school. I did my master's in industrial hygiene and safety, two years full program. Uh, but say that I I would have done something as the master's in industrial chemistry and not in industrial hygiene. And if I wanted to be in industrial hygiene field, probably I would have completed six modules of the OHTA classes. Uh, that gives me 240 contact hours and then pass the CIH. That would have saved my two years of the time uh, in uh, becoming the uh, CIH. Also, all those things uh, can be considered also. So it's not necessary that you must have IH degree or education uh, to be in the IH field. Those people with the environmental background, a chemical background or mechanical, any background in science can become uh, industrial hygienist also. And then it gives you a personal satisfaction of achievement when in the school times and all, when you were getting fifth rank or first rank, that was giving you some, some satisfaction that, OK, I have reached to some ex, uh, level which is satisfying to my uh, uh, level. I'm just trying to see if there is any hands that is raised or not. OK, so now say that Second you want question. to. Uh, Srini, just want to add ahead. something here. Yeah, Eunice, in, uh, you can also just WhatsApp me um, because I am not able to see the chat in case you have any question. Yeah, uh, so, uh, sorry to uh, ask this question in between uh, uh, of a explanation. I just want to know the examination pattern which was explained in the earlier stages regarding the short answers and all. What will be the mathematical calculation involved in this uh, total? Uh, I mean, the in the in, in for example, if there is a hundred marks, you said fifty marks is the passing thing. In that 50 marks, like uh, this, because off late, you know, just to upfront say to you people, yes, we are out of academics for the last uh, 15, 20 years. And uh, uh, yes, we can write on knowledge based questions and also with the technical parts. If you do some integration or calculus or something, we need to arrive to some, uh, some results. Uh, that was the worrying factor. Like if you need to go back to your school mathematics to uh, do this exam. Uh, you are asking uh, for the B. OK, go ahead, Lalita. I think that is for the OHTA modules. OK, yeah, you're talking about the OHTA modules, the numerical uh, questions um, actually kind of depends on the modules. Some modules do not ergonomics, health effects. <clears throat> they, not, they do not have any calculation questions, but the rest of them like measurements and noise and uh, controls. Uh, thermal environment, all these are, uh, have calculation questions uh, and they will not be uh, like you don't have to go back to school for to learn calculus and all those things. You may want to need to use the uh, log functions, uh, natural logs and so forth. Uh, not a whole lot of statistics, so it's OK, uh, but the course, the modules, we actually teach you all those functions that are involved in the calculations. Um, and once you practice them, it would not be difficult. As to the number of questions, again, uh, there is no specific number. Generally, they may range anywhere from four to ten, depending upon the module. Uh, each question on those uh, exams, there are 40 questions. Uh, each question carries four marks. So whether it is, uh, you know, like a essay type or whether it is numericals, they all have four marks each. Fine, fine. Yeah, I was just uh, checking out whether it's a descriptive one or it's a logical based one. Uh, I think so it's a combination of logical based, description based, and also some part of uh, the mathematical calculus, which was a worrying factor for me. That is the reason I just the last part. I was just trying to understand the uh, pattern of that. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. OK, so now you have decided that you want to appear for the CIH examination and give an application. So what are the eligibility requirements? You should be in the current practice of industrial hygiene, which means uh, say that you are an EHS professional or if you are a doctor, uh, your job should involve some part of uh, industrial hygiene rubrics. Uh, we will talk about it like PPE, uh, respirators, the ventilation measurements, uh, engineering controls, suggesting the control measures. All those things should be part of your uh, uh, job profile. And you should have four years of experience uh, before you give uh, exam or appear for uh, application. So that is about the practice that you need to have or the experience requirement. The second thing is the academic requirement. 
you should have a bachelor's uh, in science or engineering or any ABET approved IH or safety courses. Uh, if you do not have that ABAT approved and all, but if you have bachelor in science or engineering, then the uh, two other requirement is either you can have 180 IH academic hours. So say that I pass my master's in industrial hygiene and safety. That was for two years course. And that is that I did an academic, which means I went to college and I studied. That is called as an academic hours. So in that uh, master's degree, I had more than 180 hours of IH education. So I was qualified. I had a bachelor's in science also, and then four years of experience. So I qualified. But say that uh, I, I, I did not appear for master's degree two years course, but I had a bachelor's in industrial chemistry as my background, and uh, I wanted to appear for this examination. So I have to acquire this 240 hours of IH continuing education. Uh, by various ways. One of the way is by attending the sixth module of OHTA. Each module gives you 40 hours of the uh, credit hours and if into six, which means it becomes 240 hours. So by, by that way, you can meet the re academic requirement uh, in terms of uh, giving for the CIH exam. So that's a benefit that you get. So you get two benefits. You complete six module. You can appear for the ICERT OH certification, which is very much valid in Europe. Once you finish it, you can appear for the CH exam. Uh, once you pass the CH exam, CH has a very good recognition in the USA and the companies, uh, multinational companies who are operating in India uh, uh, will have a benefit of CH. So addition to this uh, uh, continuing hours, you must have two hours of IH ethics education. So say that you are working in your company and every year they are conducting that uh, uh, ethics classes for you. You can count that ethics classes also. Uh, at RICO every year we conduct uh, online session of CIH preparation classes. In that we add up the two hours of ethics education also. You can search on the website uh, the uh, ethic, uh, IH ethics uh, hours and you will be able to get uh, those hours also, but you need to attend those uh, two hours and then submit it to the uh, ABIH, uh, sorry, BGC when you are applying for it. So even though your uh, company's uh, ethics classes will also qualify only, thing is that classes should run for the two hours of the time. This, the, then it comes to applying to the board, uh, which means to the BGC. Once you give an application, your application is valid for two years. So when can you apply? For if you want to sit in the spring examination that is happening in April and May, you must submit your uh, application before 1st of February. Now, what all documents that you need to submit, uh, we can discuss later on, uh, but it will contain your experience uh, one letter from your company, one letter from the CIH you will need uh, who is knowing about your work, uh, professional work. And then you will also need to submit your degree evaluations also because we are in uh, our degree. Say that if I've done best in science, that is for three years, but in US and all it is four years. So they want to just ensure that whatever degree that we have acquired in India is equal to the US requirement. Then uh, we the Sir, so couldn't hear it properly. Uh, really, can you just go back? Voice was in was breaking. Could not understand. Please repeat.
So hang on a second. I think we are having trouble with Shinik's voice. Can you all hear him? OK, I am yeah. back. Now, I, now it's good. I'm sorry about it. Uh, as I said, I am at a uh, remote location, but uh, so that uh, what I was saying about this uh, one is that you must have uh, 180 IH academic hours and 240 or you should have 240 IH continuing education. Now academic hours, which means if uh, you have undergone any degree course, which is of industrial hygiene, that sir, again, must contain uh, hundred and eight. Your, your screen, Shainik. Uh, is it problem from my end? No, I think it. Uh, you want to reshare it? It your screen is not showing. I am sharing it, uh, Lalita. Uh, can't see yet. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, but screen is not showing. Is that OK now? Not yet. Yes, now it's come. Can you go back to the 180 to 40? Yeah, like from here onwards, I think. OK, now is my voice so audible? Yes. OK, uh, I'm sorry about that uh, interruption. So uh, for an eligibility, you must be in the IH practice and four years of experience. From an academic point of view, you should either have bachelor in science or engineering or American board approved uh, IH or safety course. Now, if you are undergoing so uh, cannot that- see screen. Cannot see your screen. Uh, no, we can. Yeah, can yeah. someone else yes, also yeah, give you feedback? Can. Go ahead. Yeah, you're visible. Audible okay, ability. probably uh, Roland, you may log out and log in, please. Okay, uh, so if say that you have bachelor's uh, uh, in industrial hygiene or master's in industrial hygiene, that degree course must contain 180 IH academic hours. Uh, or if you have not undergone this master's or bachelor's in industrial hygiene course, how you can acquire 240 hours of continuing education by attending the BOHS classes. So that's a six modules is there. Each module is of 40 hours, so you get 240 hours of continuing education. So that way you can get uh, and meet the 240 hours of continuing education. So now you are in practice of industrial hygiene, you have four years experience, you have bachelor's in science and 240 hours of continuing education. The third requirement is that you must complete the ethics class for two hours. So this ethics class, uh, for an example, uh, your company is conducting annual ethical classes for you. You can enroll for that and show that certificate to the ABI, sorry, BGC. They will accept it. RICO conducts also these ethics classes once in every year. You can enroll for that. We issue a certificate and then you can give it to the uh, BGCs for the application purpose. Now you are ready to apply. Now there are two windows for the application. The first window is uh, in the spring, uh, so that you have to apply before 1st February of the year. Second is in the fall. Sir, sorry for interruption. Uh, uh, I think there is no screen sharing. Okay. Um, that's okay. We can we manage. Can see. We have already. We see. But so that's okay, so we can go ahead with the, uh, the conversation. We are already in the verge of the, I mean, completion of the course, and it's uh, what is explaining is clearly understandable. It's okay, no problem. I'm sorry about uh, this aspect, but in case any issues, you can You're log visible. out once and log in, please. So you will You're need visible. two. CA okay, thanks. You will need two references uh, for applying for CIH exam. One reference should be issued by the CIH and one from your supervisor. So, so the CIH must be aware about your work background and all, and they will write about uh, what you are doing. So for an example, I know Chandrasekhar. So Chandrasekhar tomorrow goes for an application of CIH. Uh, if he approaches me, I will write a reference for Chandrasekhar 
and certify that the type of things uh, that he is doing in the industrial hygiene field and I will send it to BGC. And one reference, you will need it from the supervisor, your supervisor. So uh, say that your supervisor will certify that yes, uh, Chandrasekhar is working in the industrial hygiene field and these are the responsibility he has in the industrial hygiene. So this is what you will need to submit. So ensure you have a good re relationship with your supervisor also. But sometimes what happens that you left that company and the previous supervisor has also left that company. And if you want uh, or if your supervisor is not agreeing to write a reference for you, you can approach the other person in the company who is familiar with the job and then they can write a reference to you. I have faced uh, such type of things with many candidates where the previous supervisor is not available uh, or is not agreeing to provide a uh, reference for the candidate. Then uh, we have approached to the company's management saying that uh, we need this certificate and then they have issued the such type of references also so that is acceptable. So now uh, your application is approved. There are two windows where you can sit in the examination. One is a spring window, so which means April and May. Anytime you can give this uh, exam, uh, one day you select in between April and May and you can go to the uh, Prometric Center. Uh, it is like TOEFL Center where we go and give an online exam. I will show you in the next few slides. So uh, if you want to apply in, uh, give exam in April and May, ensure your uh, application reaches before 1st of February. If you want to apply, uh, give examination in October and November, any one day, your application must reach before 1st of August. Since we are out of USA and this examination is as per the US uh, requirements and all, uh, uh, our degree is not as per the US requirement, but uh, there are certifying agencies in USA who will certify your degree. So we have to send our transcript to those agencies. They will evaluate our uh, degree in the industry, uh, sorry, in the bachelor's in science or engineering, and they will certify to BGC that yes, this candidate has the right uh, educational requirement as per the US system. So that foreign degree evaluation is also done. Now let's come to the fee structure. When you want to apply for an application, the application fee is 150 US dollar. Once your application is approved, your examination fee is $350. Uh, the foreign degree evaluation ranges between 90 to 120 US dollar and the renewal or the annual uh, examination, uh, sorry, annual uh, fee is 150. The renewal comes once in five years, but annual fee you have to pay every year. That is 150 US dollar. So do you have any questions till now? So one question is that uh, the pre-request, uh, pre-requisite which you mentioned for this, you know, that is that uh, 270 hours and other things. Uh, uh, in the in all the three, any one is okay or all the three should be fulfilled? So uh, you should have bachelor's in science or engineering. That is one requirement. Second, either 180 mm -hmm. hours of IH education or 240 hours of continuing education. Either of it is fine. Okay. So bachelor, bachelor plus any either one is sufficient. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So now uh, Benazir, the research. Uh, uh, Benazir has a question. He has raised his hand. Benazir. Okay, go ahead. Um, to the previous slide, uh, the 180 academic credit hours, um, does it have to be um, a course that is approved by the ABE or any other master's course? Okay. Uh, no, it is not, uh, uh, has to be approved only. Uh, you can approach the BGC for an example in India. There is one institute where I've done masters in industrial hygiene and safety. So what we do is it is not approved by the ABET, but we send a note to the BGC saying that I have studied from this uh, institute and this is a 180 IH academic hours. They accept it. So it's not always that it is mandatory that it has to be ABET approved. Uh, the BGC will review your academic transcript of industrial hygiene and they can approve as 180 uh, education hours. Does it make sense, Ibenzel? Yes, yes. Good. So say that now you have successfully passed the examination 
every five years you have to recertify your cell, which means uh, you don't need to necessarily give the examinations, but you have to maintain the points during these five years of the time. So you have to maintain, you have to acquire 40 points in five years. So every year, uh, minimum you should have uh, eight points. It's not mandatory, but I, I get eight to 10 points every year uh, from that. So how can you earn this recertification point? You can earn it by being in the field of industrial hygiene. So if you are in the field of industrial hygiene, you get certain points uh, every year. Uh, if you are participating in the EHS training conferences, which is related to the industrial hygiene, you get certain points about it. If tomorrow you go to some conferences, you are presenting uh, over there, you get certain points from there. If you are publishing paper, if you pass the CSP exam, or say in the India, there is a CIHS, Central Industrial Hygiene Association. They have a committee there. If you are participating in that committee, you get uh, some points so, so which you can claim it as your recertification points. Otherwise, if you are an AIHA member, they also have a different committees where you can earn this recertification points. OK, so now let's talk about the examination structure. It is a computer based examinations. Uh, there are pro metric testing center. You have to fix an appointment or a date by paying the 350 US dollar as an examination fee to BGC. BGC will send you a letter of approval and then you can set up a date and day with the Prometric website and then you can block that date for the examination. Now that exam duration is for six hours. Uh, morning there is a two and a half hours of the examination. There is an optional break over there. Uh, if you don't want to take that break, uh, it will uh, you can go into the afternoon session of two and a half hours. So it's around five and a half hours of the duration, including the break. But without the break, it's uh, uh, five hours of the duration. So there are 180 questions. Uh, all are multiple choice questions, so they can ask you uh, questions. What is a flow rate uh, of uh, uh, respirable dust with aluminum cyclone? They give you option 2.5 liters per minute as a A. B 2.3 liters per minute, C 2.1 liters per minute, and D 2 liters uh, 2 liters per minute. Out of these four options, you have to select the right uh, answer. Once you click the answer, that will get recorded over there. Uh, you will not come to know whether it's right or wrong until you uh, pass your examination. Uh, so, but there is no penalty for any wrong question. So, even if you are giving a wrong answer, there will not be any penalty to that. So. Uh, this is the, another question that people ask that how much should I get as a percentage to pass the CIH examination? Now, it it uh, BGC have never disclosed what is a passing score and all, so I am not aware about it. But in my opinion, if you are scoring above 65 to 70 percent, you can be sure that you can pass the examination. Any score below 65 percent, in my opinion, I will say that uh, will be less to pass the CIH examination. OK, do you have any question? Perfect. Otherwise, you can raise your hand and uh, Lalita will uh, take me. Yeah, to those, Srinik, uh, yeah. This, uh, John, John Minard, he has a question. Go ahead, John. Hi, uh, I have a question actually uh, regarding the the coursework. So the, uh, is uh, BGC recognizing the the in, uh, certification like uh, CSP or CHMM as part of the eligibility? Uh, no, uh, you cannot no. count the other certification course as an eligibility. You must have oh. that uh, 240 hours of continuing education. Uh, certification will not be counted as an eligible ed, eligibility. All right, all right. Thank you so much. Thanks for asking. OK, so let me take you through the summary of the certification process. First thing is you have to apply online. OK, and determine your eligibility. Eligibility, which means four years of IH experience, uh, 240 uh, uh, continuing IH education hours, foreign degree evaluation, one reference from your CIH, uh, the person who knows, and one reference from your supervisor. With that, you, the BGC will approve your examination. You can purchase an examination and schedule your time. You can sit for an examination. If you pass, 
congratulations you receive a certificate so the moment you submit 180 questions at the end they will give you the preliminary result whether you are pass or fail the detailed result will come at the later stage but at the end of that fifth hours once you click a submit button you will get whether uh, uh, your results whether you have passed or failed but in case if you fail don't get disappointed everyone do not pass at the first attempt you may have to attend for the uh, second time also so but for appearing for the second time again you have to uh, give a uh, 350 us dollar and then purchase the exam and again sit for the examination once you pass your uh, certificate and receive the certification you have to maintain that certificate and every five years you have to submit your report that what all you have gained as a points and then submit it to the format which BGC is giving now online. So the recertification is every five years, but the annual renewal fee of 150 US dollar you will have to pay every December. Uh, the five years recertification fee will be different than the annual recertification. OK, now there will be a question that what percentage of the students are passing? So I have a score from 2015 to 19. This I have taken it from the BGC's website. So you can see here in, in the 2019, in the fall examinations, total 278 candidate appeared, 135 candidate passed and remaining failed. So the passing score, means passing percentage was 48.6%. So the lowest score, lowest people of passing this examination was in 2018 where the 43% was there, but the highest number of people passing was in the 2015 where 54% passed. So you can say that 50% on an average, 50% of the candidate are passing out of the total people who appear for the examination. Now you can use a calculator, but there are approved calculators available. These presentations will be sent to you, uh, so you can refer this uh, also to the BGC's candidate manual also. But in my opinion, uh, or, or what I want you to focus here is, you must take two calculators with you during the examinations, because if one fails, the other will help you out. The second thing is, both the uh, calculator must be of same model. Uh, don't have it like you have a KCO model for during the preparation time and during examination time you are taking the HP model because uh, it, uh, you have already practiced on the KCO. If in the examination comes to the HP model, the calculation may take more time uh, for it. So you shouldn't be purchasing two different models to purchase the same models only. OK, the good thing about the CIH exam is uh, there are calculations available. And for those calculations, uh, they have given the um, a kind of uh, equations by which you can calculate. So for ventilation, it is there, noise is there, radiation is there, air samplings and everything is there. So you can refer the manual and in that you will be able to know. Uh, in our uh, online classes uh, for the CH exam preparations, we cover everything in detail on how to calculate and all those things. We are going to offer online classes in February and March, which will be online every uh, Saturday and Sunday uh, for two hours of the time. Uh, we can discuss it those aspects later on. And if you are following us on the LinkedIn, you will come to know about uh, uh, it at the later stage. So exam domain from where these questions are asked, around 50% of the questions will be from exposure assessment principles and the practices. Control selections, implementation and validation, 35% of the uh, exams will be covering that. And risk management is around 15%. If you want to know what are the content of each of this domain, I have summarized here, like exposure assessment, there will be a definitions, how to perform the qualitative assessment, sampling method, communications of the results, standards, uh, process knowledge and analytical chemistry. Those are the parts of the domain one. Domain two, which talks about the control aspects, how are you going to select the controls? Uh, you should have a design knowledge that how the ventilation has to be designed. If there is a dust, what should be the a velocity for dust, what should be the velocity for uh, vapors and all those things, how to select the right PPE, the policy developments and the validations, whether the controls are working effectively or not. And the last domain is on the risk management, where you should have a knowledge about how the IH programs are developed, what are the regulatory requirement, uh, audit skills uh, and certain guideline uh, related to the industrial hygiene, that knowledge you must have. OK, do you have any questions till now? 
perfect so let me uh, take you through the rubrics uh, these are basically uh, a type of uh, uh, topics of industrial hygiene that is part of uh, industrial hygiene uh, CIH examination so in air sampling and instrumentations there can be a questions about selection and use of the media how to perform calibrations how to uh, make a calculations in the analytical chemistry they can ask you about the different analysis procedures the gcir that analytical instrument related aspects the basic science uh, related chemistry uh, biology related things calculation of gas laws and concentration is something that they will ask you about they will also have a topic on the biohazards like biological agent of virus bacteria mold uh, and fungi infectious diseases in the industry and the agriculture one the biostatistics and the epidemiology community exposure so these are the different rubrics for which the examinations will be set up so there is a engineering control also so you should have knowledge about local exhaust ventilation system how to design the ventilation system what are the calculations related to the design and measurements ergonomics they ask you about the anthropometry human factors and the biomechanics related aspects and there is also a rubrics on the health risk analysis and hazards communications so basically it is around acgih uh, threshold limit values the biological exposure indices and certain standards and guidelines so uh, these rubrics are absolutely useful to you uh, in preparing for the examination i have just summarized the, what are the key contents of it in detail uh, it is available on the manual uh, but i will not go to the manual otherwise it will consume more time so in the ih program management how to perform an auditing how to develop a program in the noise aspects they can ask you questions about the health effects of the noise how to calculate the dose percentage convert in the twa the audiometric testing requirements the non engineering control they can ask about the pp selection what is the limitation of the pps and all so these are the things uh, that i have summarized for each of the rubrics like radiation health effects for uh, thermal stressors the measurement and the control measures aspect so this is what uh, you should be having as a part of uh, the rubrics information the next thing is reference from where you should start your study for the ch examination so either of this book is fine the left hand side is the fundamental of industrial hygiene uh, from the barbara uh, i like it during my college days it was there the second one we call it as a white book also the the right hand side the occupational environment any one of this is fine uh, this is based on my experience uh, if you go to the bgc's manual there are many uh, uh, reference books are given but if you go with my experience these are some of the things that i will suggest uh, that you should have the second one is strongly suggest that industrial ventilation manual uh, you should have it talks about the terminology some ventilation equation standards uh, for the design and the performance criteria also this you can find it in google the osha that is occupational safety and health administration it's a regulatory body uh, there uh, uh, regulations 1910 which is talking about occupational safety and health hazards you should go through those key terminologies on noise reduction rating respirator type hearing conservation program asbestos and air sampling one this one also toxicology aspects this is a very big book uh, but may be useful to you during the examination so toxicological principles this one you must have uh, so note it down if you don't have all the uh, remaining material it's fine but this one is a kind of uh, a summary of each of the element or the rubrics that is called as a industrial hygiene reference and study guide it is available on the aih store it is available online so you can purchase it it is a very uh, well described one liner aspects about each of the activities so you must have this uh, as a thing and then the tlb booklet now uh, there is a 2022 tlb booklets available uh, it talks about what is the exposure limits uh, what are some of the biological exposure indices the definitions of the stel twa heat stress related limits and all is part of it so very useful for the examination preparations also the third optional things that is available you can google it bowen ehs they have a online quiz uh, or every week the bowen ehs will send you uh, a quiz uh, or a questions related to cih 
So that's uh, uh, an excellent resource also. You can subscribe to them also. AIHA University has a uh, access like you can access for uh, uh, one year of the time. There are many books uh, available online by AIHA, which will be useful for you for the preparation of CIH exam. It is around 300 US dollar for one year subscription. So but you get so many of the books online to read for your CIH examinations also. OK, so I will just quickly take you through my journey because some of you may be interested that how is it going to be useful? We talk about Pinky. Pinky was a safety officer and then now she's a global leader in industrial hygiene. Yeah, any question? OK, so I passed in 2005, graduated. I joined 3M in 2007. I passed out my CIH in 2010 and I was made Training. an industry. Yeah. Go ahead, Lalita. You have a Benzer. question from, uh, sorry. Ebenezer, you have a question for Srinik? Yes. Ebenezer? Can't hear you. Um, can't hear me. Can't hear me now. A little bit louder. Yeah. Can you hear Shrinik? No. OK, maybe we can come back and take uh, the can't hear you. Ibn Azir will come back to you in a bit. OK. Yeah, so you ahead. graduated in 2005. I, sorry, I graduated in 2005, joined 3M, passed out uh, my CIH uh, uh, from uh, ABIH, and I thank to 3M because 3M supported me in all the CIH preparation. Perry Logan, John Mohalson, uh, uh, those were the, my mentors uh, in the 3M. Uh, so I passed my CIH exam in 2010. I was given responsibility to lead all India sites for industrial hygiene. In 2012, I passed my CSP and then I was made site EHS leader and Asia Pacific IH subject matter expert. I joined GE in 2014 as Asia leader and then global leader in 2018 and 2020. I started my own consulting business. So preparation strategy, I will say that study hard. You should have your own schedule. Follow that schedule. Uh, don't disengage with the world because sometimes when you are preparing for CIH, you'll say, I will not go in this social function. I will not go for the movie. I will not spend uh, time with my relatives and all. Don't do that things. Uh, you should continue to do that. Only thing is you should have a very good mentor who can help you out in the preparation time uh, and then help you when you are really disappointed if certain things are not going uh, the way you want. And when you are preparing for it, care for yourself. Uh, I, I used to study very hard, but I used to get some time for myself doing exercises, uh, uh, break in between also, uh, and then avoid the negative folks, those who say it's very hard and all those things. Yes, it is hard, but it is not impossible to pass. If we prepare well, probably we will be able to do it uh, perfectly fine. So <clears throat> this was my schedule that I used to follow. Uh, uh, you, I. If you are comfortable, you can make it for yourself also. So I used to have uh, when I used to travel in a bus from home to office, which was one hour, I used to take the books with me and read it over there. Once uh, I come back home, I spend some time uh, for the readings and all. And then in the evening also, I used to get it things. And uh, Saturday, Sunday, I used to have uh, more time for the CIH reading because Saturday, Sunday was off. So those type of things you can make it up. Also, I made my own calendar that on this day I'm going to finish uh, from 9th uh, of the March uh, to uh, 12th of the March. I'm going to read about analytical chemistry, then radiation, then the thermal stress and all. So that will give you a goal that within four days you need to finish this analytical chemistry also. And then I used to have my timetable that OK, uh, for this non-engineering control, I'm going to spend two hours on the data camp software. Target date is 28 December. What was my actual completion date? So by that way also I used to compare myself whether I have really covered all the aspects within the target line or not. So if you are comfortable, you can do it. 
this was my personal note actually. Uh, so if I was reading the air sampling one from somewhere from the data cam CD or some other reference books, I used to make my notes uh, for my uh, remembrance whether I have covered all the areas or not. So you can have it like this also. So preparation strategy, uh, I will say that uh, when on the day of uh, examination day, plan to go there early. Uh, don't do the last minute things there. My preparation experience, it will take you one to two years of the time, so prepare early. Apply six months before the submission date uh, and then at least study hard uh, one hour every day and four hours on the weekend time. Work in a group so you can make a group of people who is uh, uh, applying for the CH exam so you can share the knowledge with them also. So at, at the end, what I want to say is get a mentor who can help you in this examination preparation, what to read, what not to read, that things will be done and use them whenever you want to. If you want me to be helping you for this one, I will be more than happy. Everyone have a different way of working. I know uh, Herschel, he has different way of working. He works till late nights and all those things. You may have your own way of working. You can figure it out by yourself also, which works best for you. And study as much as possible to you and use all the helpful advices that you agree with from these presentations or from anyone uh, that will help you in the CH examination. So that's all I have uh, on this yeah, uh, CH like, examination. Uh... Benazir has a question for you. What he says is if it will be OK to um, read past editions of the books or you have to go with the current edition. Uh, like it, if current it, edition of fundamentals is the seventh one, can you go ahead and study fifth edition? Is it OK? It is OK. Uh, in my opinion, it's not going to have a major difference except 10 percent or some new things that has come up, but it will not make a significant uh, difference. Uh, but if you have not purchased the uh, books and if you have to purchase, then I will suggest that go with the new edition one. If you have already purchased and it is of the past version, don't worry. That will that is still valid. Any other questions? Yes, yeah, Shrenik, I'm having a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, are we going to get this presentation? Which you have shown? Yes. Yes. OK. OK. OK, fine, fine. Uh, that's OK from my side. Now I want to leave because I'm having a meeting schedule, right? Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Lalita, ma'am. Um, bye, Harshad. Thank you. Um, yeah, Shini, yeah, one more Thanks. from Thanks. Neil. Go ahead, Neil. You need to unmute your line, Neil. Yes, I want to raise this one. I just, uh, if you didn't have the experience for industrial hygiene, you can take the exam for the CHI? Uh, no, you uh, should have experience in industrial hygiene of four years. Then uh, only you can take examination. Then only uh, your application yeah, because, will be approved. Yeah, yeah, because our experience in is on occupational health and safety. So I have my degree in science and also I received my diploma in occupational hygiene. So I need more experience on the, the industrial hygiene. So if you do not experience, you cannot take the exam, right? Exactly. Well, if you're an occupational uh, doctor, some of your part will oversee like toxicology aspect, the audiometry things. Sometimes you are supervising the industrial hygiene work that is happening at the site. Uh, that is fine. So it is not that if you are a okay. doctor, you are, do not have an experience. Some part of your job involves the industrial hygiene related aspect. So you will qualify. If you are a doctor, you will definitely qualify for CIH examination. Only thing is you should have four years of experience in your doctor occupational health uh, one that will qualify you for this CIH examination. I, okay, okay. Thank you very much for the clear uh, information. Thank you. Yes, thank we can. You. Thank you. Vigen Kumar? Uh, we are not able to hear you, Vigen Kumar. Uh, mute and unmute your line one more time, please. Uh, think, uh, Vigen. Sir, is it okay now? Yes, go ahead. 
Yes, I have two doubts, sir. First one is uh, uh, the education requirements itself, because I had a internet connection issue. I'm not sure what is what is the issue. Uh, my question uh, on that is, uh, so we need to have all these three, like uh, four years exp uh, experience, a bachelor's degree, uh, 180 hours IH uh, uh, learning, and uh, 240 hours uh, uh, IH learning, or uh, any, any one of this is optional. Uh, so if you have a degree in industrial IT, 180 hours is fine. If you don't have a degree in industrial hygiene, you must get 240 continuing IH education hours. Okay, so, so means either. Either, either one of that, either 180 IH hours or 240 hours. Correct. Okay, sir. so it means our uh, six modules will help me to uh, get through. Correct, absolutely. Okay, sir. And uh, the second doubt is, um, uh, is there any plan like uh, uh, you'll be supporting us for like a, a review, like a reviewing or uh, uh, how I can say is like mentoring to achieve uh, I certification OH? Yes, we are happy to do that. If you are interested, uh, we can help you out in mentoring it. Oh, okay, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, and uh, uh, is it possible to share any details like how can we contact you on that or uh, do we have to enroll or do we have any crash course like that something like that yeah so we will be conducting cih exam preparation class in february and march so that is one thing but if you don't attend that class we can still mentor you it's not necessary that you have to come to that class Uh, okay, so noted. How about uh, any classes for ISAT OH, sir? Is, is, is... Uh, no, we don't offer uh, ISAT OH uh, class because it is about the uh, all the project preparation and all those things, but we can guide you on that. Okay, so like, like uh, stage-wise review and support, you can yes, do Yes, that. that can be done. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. Uh, I will say that if there is no question, we really uh, sincerely thank you for attending it. This presentation material, we will send it to you uh, after two days of the time once we compile everything. And anytime you have, you have any questions uh, around it, we will be more than happy to help you out at any point in time. So with this, I'll say thank you everyone uh, and enjoy your weekend. Thanks, Renik. Thank Thanks, you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank 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 you.